Hello and welcome to Session 13 of the Basic Tax Course. We're going to begin Session 13 with a review of the Session 12 Quiz. And we're going to begin with Session 12 Quiz right at the top on question number one. You can claim the mortgage interest credit if which of the following is true. A, you own and occupy a home in a low-income neighborhood. B, you itemize your deductions. C, you hold a mortgage interest credit certificate. Or D, all of the above. Well, the only one of these that's actually fully true is that you must hold a mortgage interest credit certificate. You do not need to itemize your deductions at all to claim the home mortgage interest credit. You need to hold the certificate. And if you have the certificate, you claim the credit. And even if you claim the credit, it is still possible to claim an itemized deduction for your mortgage interest expense after you reduce that mortgage interest expense by the amount of mortgage credit that you are claiming. But this line here about you own and occupy a home in a low-income neighborhood, that actually has nothing to do with the home mortgage interest credit certificate at all. It may be the case that because you purchased a home in a qualifying neighborhood that you qualified for the certificate, that you apply for and receive the certificate at the time you are purchasing your home. And the criteria for qualifying a buyer and a home are, be, are made at the state level. And so the state uh, that is issuing the certificate is going to determine whether or not you have a qualifying purchaser of a home. But once that certificate is issued to the purchaser, that enables the purchaser to claim the credit. So ultimately, for question number one, C is the only correct answer. Moving on, question number four, the credit for prior year minimum tax might apply if you paid alternative minimum tax in a prior year for which of the following? A, incentive stock options, B, employee business expenses, C, investment interest expense, or D, the standard deduction. Well, the credit for prior year minimum tax applies in certain situations where you are working with a deferral item. And a deferral item is an item that is deductible, but maybe not currently under the rules for the AMT. Sometimes the rules for AMT completely disqualify a particular deduction from being claimed at all. And an example of a disqualified deduction for purposes of alternative minimum tax is an employee business expense. Simply not allowed. Also, the standard deduction is simply not allowed. Ultimately, the one thing we know for sure that could make you eligible for credit for prior year minimum tax is incentive stock options. And what happens with incentive stock options is that the year you acquire those incentive stock options and you purchase them at a discount, you have to report that discounted price, that is the spread between what you paid for them and the fair market value of the stock in income, and pay tax in that stock under the income rules for alternative minimum tax. They're not included in income for the regular tax, but they are for AMT. And subsequent to that, the rules for AMT do provide that a credit may be possible. Complex formula, we talk about all of this and how to calculate it in our uh, CPE series course called Understanding the Alternative Minimum Tax, a rather advanced topic for a basic tax course. However, uh, that still makes A the correct answer for number four. Moving on to question number seven. The maximum lifetime learning credit you can claim is which of the following? A, $2,000 per eligible student for, per year, $2,000 maximum per return for all eligible students, 10% of your eligible student's tuition, or none of the above. And of course, we have to look to the type of credit this is. For the lifetime learning credit, the maximum qualifying expense is $10,000, and the percentage rate on that expense is 20%. So the maximum credit is $2,000 that you could claim in any one year on your tax return, regardless of the number of students, B being the correct answer. Moving on to number 10, which of the following statements is true? The American Opportunity Credit is 100% of the first $4,000 of qualifying expenses. The Lifetime Learning Credit is 20% of the first $2,000 or expenses. Or with C, with three qualifying students on your return, you could claim a combined American Opportunity Credit of $7,500 if each qualifying student has $4,000 or more of expenses. Interestingly, this is a frequently most uh, missed question. And the reason is I think a lot of students really have a hard time conceiving that a client could really get a $7,500 tax credit on their return. And the answer is yes, they can. And I've actually had clients where we've got maybe one parent and two kids all in the same household going to college at the same time. They're all enrolled in degree programs. They have, are all eligible for the American Opportunity Credit. And so ultimately, assuming they have at least $4,000 of expense each, you do get a formula that would give you a $7,500 credit. 
But going back up, the American Opportunity Credit is 100% is of the first $4,000 of qualified expense. That is not a true statement. The correct answer is 100% of the first $2,000 of expense and 25% of the second $2,000 of expense. Then we move on to the lifetime learning credit, 20% of the first $2,000 of expense. That is false. It is actually 20% of the first $10,000 of expense, and ultimately C is the correct choice. So that concludes the review of the Session 12 quiz answer key. Of course, the rest of the answer key is sitting here or is available for you to review. And uh, any other questions about the Session 12 quiz, please feel free to use the Q&A forum. And let's move on now with the Session 13 lecture. Well, good morning, everyone. It is the top of the hour, and we are ready to begin today's class. The topic of today's class is federal tax credits for families with children. I used to teach federal tax credits pretty much just in the form order as they appear on the 1040 form, and I'd start with the foreign tax credit and move down from there. But about three years ago, I decided I think it's time to basically pull out all of the credits that relate to children and put those in a separate course all by themselves. And the reason I decided to do that is after years and years of teaching this program and years and years of supervising my staff, I could tell that people get the rules confused, that you may think you've got a handle on the rule for the child tax credit, but what you really have is an understanding of the rule for the dependency exemption. Or you may think you understand what a dependent is, but there's more to a dependent because you have to divide dependents into the category of either qualifying relative or qualifying child. People seem to think they have a good handle on the concept of head of household and when a married person can qualify for that status. Lots of people seem to think they have a good grasp on the topics, and yet, the IRS says that one of the most frequent errors that occurs on tax returns is tax preparers selecting the wrong filing status, giving dependency exemptions where they shouldn't, giving the earned income credit where they shouldn't, the list goes on, and they're all related to children. So why is the topic confusing? Well, the topic's confusing because there are so many rules, and some of the benefits associated with children have similar rules, but sometimes there's subtle differences in those rules and really getting a, a grasp, a mental handle on the exact rules that apply to each specific kind of tax benefit really just takes a long time and a lot of intense study. So what I decided to do is take all of those concepts, wrap them into one course, and really start to point out the differences and the similarities for each of the topics that we're going to be discussing today. And to start the class off, I decided to put up a couple of poll questions, and these poll questions are now up on the screen in front of you, and I'm just going to release the, the responses so you can see people how they've answered. And the topic of today's class, the question I asked is, as a tax preparer, do you consider the topics of dependency, earned income credit, child tax credit to be simple, easy, confusing? Where do you find them? And most of you are saying somewhere in the middle. I think it's easy, but sometimes I'm confused. And one person said I find it very confusing, and a couple of people have said I find it super easy. So just to kind of drive home a point, I decided to put up a question on the screen, and this question comes from the Oregon License Tax Consultant Exam. And for those of you who are not familiar with Oregon's licensing laws, Oregon stands out as a very unique state in the nation in that mandatory education, testing, continuing education, and licensing have been in place in this state for 40 years. And the tax consultant exam is a higher level exam. To sit that exam, an Oregon tax practitioner must have worked a minimum of 1,100 hours as a tax preparer over a minimum of a two-year period. They must already have taken an 80-hour course in basic tax law and then passed a preparer exam, which is quite a difficult exam, far more difficult than the IRS's RTRP exam. And then they have to apprentice for a two-year period under the supervision of people with more experience. When they've achieved all of those accomplishments, 
then they can go sit a higher level exam called the LTC exam. And if they pass that test, then they're awarded the LTC credential. And in the state of Oregon, an LTC credential it gives a tax practitioner the same status as perhaps an enrolled agent might have with the IRS. And in fact, the state of Oregon actually doesn't recognize the status of enrolled agent as adequate. You also have to be an LTC here. So I thought, well, wouldn't it be interesting if I took a question from a test and this question, of course, is being answered by people who have been working in Oregon presumably for at least two years under the supervision of more experienced people, and now they're going to go sit an LTC a test, and how do they respond? Well, this question that you see right here is a most frequently missed question from the LTC exam, and it's not just most frequently missed once in a while. It's pretty much every year the Oregon Tax Board releases a list of the most frequently missed questions from the past year. And this question is on the list every year. <laughs> you would think that people would read it, see it, understand it, research it, and then ace it on the test, and yet still people are missing it. So let's look at what it says. It says, John is married but has not lived with his wife since May of the tax year. His mother lived with him all year, and he paid all of the costs of keeping up the home. He can claim an exemption for his mother. This taxpayer can qualify as head of household. Well, we can see on the board here we're pretty evenly split. We've got a little over half of you saying the answer is false, and about 44% of you saying the answer is true. And those of you who answered false are correct. This situation does not meet the test for being considered unmarried, and therefore this filer does not qualify as head of household. So why is that the case? Well, we're not even dealing with a child situation here, and that's actually part of the problem. This taxpayer did not keep up a home for more than half the year for his qualifying child. He kept up the home for his qualifying relative. So we're going to be exploring today in today's class what the difference is between those two things as we move on. So I'm just going to close off, hide these two poles, and I'm going to actually move right away over to page 3. And on page 3 you'll see that we've got the back side of 1040, <laughs> or page 2 of 1040. And page 2 of 1040 I'm essentially showing you in pink the topics that are going to be covered in today's class. We'll actually go into a little bit more topic than what you see here in pink. But pink are the credits specifically that we're going to be focusing on today. And they include the child and dependent care credit, the child tax credit, the earned income credit, the additional child tax credit, and then this box C here is kind of pink, but you kind of may not notice it because it's in the midst of a yellow line. Well, that is for the adoption credit. And we will be talking about that today because obviously adoption credits only apply when you adopt a child, well, at least for most people. So that is a topic for today. Now, every other credit that you see identified in yellow is not covered in today's class. Topics that are in yellow are covered in other classes that we offer on credits. We have one class called Federal Tax Credits for Individuals in which we discuss the foreign tax credit, education credits, the retirement savings credit, uh, the American Opportunity Credit. And those are all discussed in the Federal Tax Class for Individuals. And then we have another class, again, where we talk about tax credits for business. But today we're talking about what we could consider to be the basics, the foundation of pretty much a very large percentage of American tax returns. And let's find out what it takes to do a tax return correctly today <laughs> with the IRS. Now, as a general rule, we learn more by doing than we do by seeing or listening, right? Experience is everything. And as a tax practitioner, when we first enter the industry, our head is exploding with knowledge from what we've been able to learn and that we're trying to absorb. And as time goes on, we really learn through the school of hard knocks what the truth is. And sometimes we can go about taxes and do something the wrong way for a long, long time, and then all of a sudden one day we go, oh, I didn't know that. Have we ever had a moment like that? Well, with that in mind, a couple of years ago I created the problem that you see is now our course discussion for today's class. And I started off by saying, as a general study or memorization of the rules that apply to claiming tax benefits associated with children rarely results in a true understanding of how these rules interrelate with each other, it's best to learn by doing. And so I decided to create a challenge, and the challenge for today's class is for us to get our head around all of the following concepts, which are 
put together today so we can see how they interrelate and how they are actually different. The first of these is the head of household filing status. We'll also look at the rules for claiming dependence, the rules for a qualifying child and qualifying relative, the child tax credit, the additional child tax credit, the earned income credit, and the child and dependent care credit. Now, to do this, I've created a story, and the characters in the story are Jack and Sylvia. They are an unmarried couple who lived together all year. They paid more than half the cost of supporting the following children who lived with them all year. We have George, age 9, who is the son of Jack. We have Samantha, age 12, who is the daughter of Jack. We have Ben, age 14, who is the son of Sylvia. We have Becky, age 3, who is a daughter of both Jack and Sylvia. And then we have Jonathan, age 16, who's living with Jack and Sylvia, but not related to either of them. So specifically, George, age 9, and Samantha, age 12, are Jack's children, but Sylvia is not their mother. Ben, age 14, is the son of Sylvia, but Jack is not his father. Becky, age 3, is the child of both Jack and Sylvia. And Jonathan is the son of Sylvia's best friend who was incarcerated all year. Sylvia and Jack are caring for John as they would their own child, and they share the cost of his support equally. So here's the question that we're going to be answering, but before we get on to those questions, let's give you a little bit of extra information. Jack's earned income and AGI is $26,000, and Jack paid 51% of the cost of keeping up the house. Jack received $200 of government housing assistance each month for the year, and Jack paid $500 of after-school care for George during the year. Information relating to Sylvia only includes the fact that Sylvia has earned income and adjusted gross income equal to $27,000. She paid 49% of the cost of keeping up the home. She received $400 in food stamps for each month of the year, and she paid $2,500 of child care expense for Becky during the year. So let's look at the questions. The first question I have for you is, what is the filing status of Jack? And what is the filing status of Sylvia? Which children could Sylvia be able to claim as dependents on her return? And by that we mean, if we look at the rules for qualifying child, qualifying relative, and the ability to claim a person as a dependent on your return, without regard to who else might also be able to claim that child on a return, which children of the ones listed can Sylvia claim as dependents on her return? And by that same token, which dependents could Jack claim on his return? Now, I would like you to name the children that Sylvia could claim for the child tax credit, and then name the children that Jack could claim for the child tax credit. Which children can Sylvia claim for EIC, and which children could Jack claim for EIC? Can Sylvia claim the child care credit, and if so, for which child or children? And can Jack claim the child care credit, and if so, for which children? Finally, what are the possible tax return and potential refund scenarios for Jack? We would like you to look at the chart in here and look at the possible scenarios for Jack. Possible for scenarios for Jack are uh, what you see in these columns here, that he could claim these two dependents, George and Samantha, or he could claim George, Samantha, and Becky, or George, Samantha, and Jonathan, or George, Samantha, Becky, and Jonathan. And similar, we see down here for Sylvia a chart with similar options, but perhaps a little bit different in the children that we've selected. And if you were to go and file for Jack with the scenario we see here where he claims George and Samantha, you'd start with his AGI, you'd figure his standard deduction, you'd figure his personal exemption deductions to arrive at his taxable income, you'd then figure his tax, you'd then apply the child care credit that he qualifies for, then the child tax credit, we'd arrive at his tax after non-refundable credits, We'd then figure the earned income credit, and we'd finally finish off by figuring the additional child tax credit. When we're done with all of that, we would figure out how much of a refund Jack is entitled to based on credits alone, without regard to any withholding he might have had. And we do that for every scenario going across the board. And then we do the same for Sylvia. And when we're all done, based on the computations that we've done for both Jack and Sylvia, what is the ideal tax return for scenario for this couple and their children? What is the way that they could file legally? It's a legal tax return that the IRS would say, yes, it was done correctly. 
what way would they file legally where they share the dependents in such a fashion as that they maximize the overall refunds that they can get as a couple? That's the challenge for today's class. So as we're going through today's class, I'm going to come back periodically to the questions in here, and then as we get to the end of the class, we'll actually put up the answer key and go through with what I came up with, and you can compare that to what you came up with. And with that, we're going to move on to the first topic of the day, which is the Child and Dependent Care Credit. This credit is claimed on the Form 1040, Long Form 1040 on Line 48. It is possible to claim it on the short form as well, but when I teach, I always teach based on the long form. Now, the first word I have for you is do not confuse the Child and Dependent Care Credit with the Child Tax Credit. And I say that because if you're ever in an exam situation or even if you're inside one of Pacific Northwest Tax Schools, self-study programs and we ask you a question, a test question, you need to stop and read the question slowly enough to absorb the actual topic that the question is asking you a question about. Are we asking you a question about the child independent care credit or are we asking you a question about the child tax credit because they are completely different credits with completely different rules. And with that, let's talk about the child independent care credit. This credit relates specifically to the cost of paying for child care. It is meant to help reduce the taxes for families that pay another person or an organization to care for their children so that the parents can actually go to work. The credit also applies to taxpayers who are married or have a dependent that is mentally or physically incapable of self-care. You can only claim the credit if you work, are looking for work, or if you are a student. But if you're married, your spouse must also work or be a full-time student unless he or she is physically incapable, mentally or physically, of caring for themselves. You may only claim the credit for a qualifying person who lived with you during the year. If you are separated from your spouse, you can only claim the credit if you were the custodial parent during the year. Tests to claim the credit. Well, there's a series of seven tests that every filer who claims the child independent care credit must pass in order to be able to claim this credit. The tests, some of them are going to seem familiar to you because they might seem similar to the test for claiming a dependent, but some of them are a little bit different. The first one is that we have to have a qualifying person. You must file Form 2441 with either Form 1040 or 1040A, and on the form you need to identify the persons who qualify you for the credit. You must provide the name and the social security number or item of each qualifying person for whom you are claiming this credit. And to qualify you for the credit, the person that you are claiming must be your dependent who was under age 13 when the care was provided and for whom you can claim a dependency exemption. There is an exception to this must claim dependency exemption rule and the exception is that if you are the custodial parent of your child for whom you cannot claim a dependency exemption because of a divorce or separation decree or because you signed Form 8332, Release to Exemption for Child of Divorced or Separated Parents, or some other similar statement, then you can still claim the child independent care credit even though you are not claiming your child's dependency. But for everyone else, in order to claim the child independent care credit, you must be able to claim their exemption. And you'll see here I've underlined the words that say under the age of 13 when the care was provided. That's a little bit different than most of the rules we see with IRS because most of the time when we talk about age, the IRS says you must have been under the age blank on the last day of the year. But for the child independent care credit, we only have to have the child be under the specified age when the care was provided. So what that means is if you have a child who turned 13 during the year, any child care expense paid for that child prior to their birthday would be allowed. But from the point that child turns 13, you're no longer allowed to claim the child care expense you pay for them. Also, if your spouse was physically or mentally not able to care for him or herself and lived with you for more than half the year, then you can claim the cost of caring for your spouse while you go to work. Or your dependent who is physically or mentally incapable of self-care and for whom you can claim a dependency exemption, or you would have been able to claim their dependency exemption, except that individual had gross income of $3,800 or more. Well, the $3,800 or more rule actually has to do with the qualifying relative test, and uh, it's possible to fail one of the dependency tests for qualifying relative when the gross income goes too high. And so if you are in a scenario where you pretty much could claim a person as a dependent except they fail that gross income test, 
then you would still be able to claim the child care expenses or the dependent care expenses for that person. So that's test one. Moving on to test two, we have the earned income test. You and your spouse, unless either of you were physically or mentally incapable of self-care or either of you were students, must have earned income during the year. For purposes of this test, earned income includes wages, salaries, tips, and other employee compensation. It also includes self-employment income, but a net self-employment loss decreases your earned income. And non-taxable earned income such as parsonage allowances, meals and lodging furnished for the convenience of the employer, voluntary salary deferrals, military basic quarters, and combat pay all count as earned income even though they're not taxable for purposes of computing the child and dependent care credit. But earned income does not include Social Security, pensions or annuities, nor does it include investment income, scholarship income, unemployment or workers' compensation. Special rules for student or disabled spouse. Your spouse is considered to have earned income for any month that he or she was a full-time student or was physically or mentally incapable of self-care. Your spouse must also live with you for more than half the year. I'm just going to stop on this point for a minute because as I like to tell my students, I've been at this business a long time and for every year I've ever been in this business, I've had employees working for me and coming to me with questions. And one of the questions I regularly get from pretty much every preparer who's ever worked with me, and I get them every tax season, is a phone call. And the phone call goes something like this. April, I'm trying to get the computer to give me a child independent care credit for my filer, but it's just not working. No matter what I do, my client is not being given this credit. And so my mind is immediately turning to one of two possibilities. And the first possibility is the filing status is married filing separate. Because if the filing status is married filing separate, you can't claim the child and dependent care credit. But the other scenario that goes on is we've got a married filing joint couple. And only one of the persons actually has earned income. In other words, one of them is perhaps a stay-at-home mom and the other one is working. And if that's the case, you can't have the child and dependent care credit because both of you weren't working. You both have to have earned income. You both have to pass that test. But you can see right here we have an exception to that, that the spouse was a full-time student or the spouse was physically or mentally incapable of self-care. Well, if that's the case, how do you tell the computer that the spouse was a full-time student or was incapable of self-care? Well, essentially, you're going to have to go into the computer and find the field where you enter the amount of earned income that spouse is deemed to have. And you have to know how to figure the amount of income they are deemed to have and enter it directly on the Form 2441, at least in the software we're using. There's just not some miracle formula that the computer reads the preparer's mind and knows that information. The preparer has to tell the computer what it is. Now, sometimes there's another reason why there's a problem. And the reason has nothing to do with the eligibility of the client. It simply has to do with a data entry error on the part of the preparer. And the data entry error is that when a preparer, when you as a practitioner, enter W-2s into your computer, you should be telling the computer whose W-2 that is. Is it the taxpayer's W-2 or is it the spouse's W-2? And if you do not tell the computer which W-2 belongs to which taxpayer correctly, then the computer will probably assume that every W-2 you enter belongs to only one person. And so you could have a husband who earned $50,000 during the year and a wife who earned another $50,000 during the year, but in the computer data entry, you don't tell the computer that the second W-2 is for the spouse. So the computer assumes that the spouse had no income and won't give the credit. So there is sometimes that that happens too, just that I've seen over time with my own employees. All right, so there's this rule here too that says your spouse is considered to have earned income for any month that he or she was a full-time student or was physically or mentally incapable of self-care, and your spouse must also have lived with you for more than half the year under that condition. Test number three, work-related expense test. You must pay the child and dependent care costs to enable you to work for pay or to look for work. If you did not work for the entire year, you must include only expenses you paid while you were working or looking for work. Payments to relatives. You must make payments for child or dependent care to someone you cannot claim as a dependent. If you pay your non-dependent child to 
care for your child, in other words, you pay your non-dependent child to do child care for you, that child whom you pay must be age 19 or older by the end of the year, and they also cannot be your dependent. Test number five. Well, the IRS calls test number five the joint return test, but I think that's a rather terrible title. I call it the filing status test because it's more to do with that. You cannot claim the credit if your filing status is married filing separately, but all other filing statuses are eligible to claim the credit, including a married filing joint. If you are married, you must file a joint return to claim the credit unless you meet the filing status tests for being considered unmarried and file using the head of household filing status instead. So let's say this again. The filing status must not be married filing separate. If it is, you cannot claim the child independent care credit. In certain situations, a married person can file as head of household even though they're married. And to do that, they have to meet the tests for being considered unmarried. And what is considered unmarried? Well, I've pulled information from IRS Publication 17 on the definition for being considered unmarried as it is spelled out in Publication 17. To qualify for head of household status, you must either be unmarried or you have to be considered unmarried on the last day of the year. And you are considered to be unmarried on the last day of the year if you meet all of the following tests. Well, if we go back to the poll question I had up at the start of the class, one of the most frequently missed questions from the LTC exam, think about that question as we're reading through what it takes to be considered unmarried when you are in fact married. And the tests you have to follow are as follows you must file a separate return. And in our most frequently missed question, we are telling you that he is filing separately, right? Test number two, you must have paid more than half the cost of keeping up your home for the tax year, and our filer is doing that as well. Also, the spouse did not live with you in your home during the last six months of the tax year, and your spouse is considered to live in your home even if he or she is absent due to special circumstances, for example, military service or hospital, or perhaps education. Well, if we think back to that most frequently missed question, our taxpayer passes test number three as well. Test number four. For more than half the year, your home was the main home of your child, stepchild, or foster child. And that's where the frequently most missed question stops. Is your mother your child, stepchild, or foster child? The answer is no. And that's why that question is the most frequently missed question, because we get to rule number four for being considered unmarried. The only individual who can cause you to be considered unmarried when you are in fact married is a person who is your child, stepchild, or foster child. Moving on, and the final rule is you must be able to claim an exemption for that child, the dependency exemption for that child. But there is an exception to this rule if the only reason you cannot claim your child's exemption is because you released the exemption to the non-custodial parent under a divorce decree or on Form 8332 or a similar statement. Now, I want to pull down this question again because, uh, and I may be hammering it on it a little bit too much, but I want to give you one more piece of information about this question. About three years ago, there was a tax school instructor here in Oregon, someone who has a job just like me. They teach the basic tax course to students. And they had a student come to them and complain that this question that appeared on the LTC exam was not fair, it was a bad question, and that it should be removed. So in other words, that instructor went to the tax board and challenged the validity of this question. In other words, the fact that the board said that the true answer to this question is false, that instructor believed that the board was wrong. Now having gone through this particular question in detail, I have to ask you, is the board wrong or right? And I think based on what I've told you, you can now see with clarity that the correct answer for this question is indeed false. And it's because our filer, John, misses the category of caring for the child or keeping up a home for the child that they are claiming as a dependent. He's keeping up a home for his mother, and that's not enough. All right, so now that I've really hammered home <laughs> the concept of head of household, let's move on to test number six, the provider identification test. You must identify the person or business you pay to provide care, and you must provide the following information for each provider. The name, address, and social security number, or EIN, employer identification number, of the provider. 
Now, IRS does admit and acknowledge that sometimes providers refuse to provide this information. I actually run across it pretty frequently, particularly with stay-at-home providers. They basically offer child care services from their home, and they're thinking they're getting all this under-the-table money that they won't have to report on their return. Sometimes the person who is doing child care from home is an illegal alien, and it's the only way they can get work, so they're working from home. And they simply don't have a number perhaps to give, or they don't understand why they need to give the number, or even if they do understand why they need to give the number, they still don't want to do it. So what is a client supposed to do in a situation like that? And the answer is, well, you can actually attach a statement to the tax return, and on the statement you indicate that you attempted to get the information from the provider, what you did in an effort to get it from the provider, and that the provider refused. Now, the provider, him or herself, can be subjected to a penalty for refusing to provide the information because it is required under the law that they do provide the information. It's not like an optional thing to them. They are required to provide it. But it's understandable and acknowledged that frequently they refuse to give it. And so these are the due diligence procedures that you can follow as a tax practitioner on behalf of your client when the provider refuses to provide the information. And the final test is test number seven. It's called the Employer Paid Expenses Test. You must reduce your credit by any amount of dependent care expenses that your employer paid for you or which you had withheld from your pay tax-free. And dependent care benefits include amounts that your employer pays for your qualifying person or the fair market value of free care you receive in a daycare provided by your employer. Your salary may have been reduced to show these benefits, and if you receive these benefits, they should be reported in Box 10 of Form W-2. And then we have an earned income limit. The amount of work-related expense you claim cannot be more than your earned income for the year if you are single or considered unmarried at the end of the year, or the smaller of you or your spouse's earned income for the year if you are married at the end of the year. Now, each month in which your spouse was a student or was incapable of self-care is a month in which your spouse is treated as having earned income. And for each such month, your spouse is considered to have earned income in the amount of $250 if there's one qualifying person, or $500 if there are two or more qualifying persons. Now, if you take $250 and multiply that by 12, you've got $3,000, and that $3,000 is the maximum qualifying expense for a single dependent who you are claiming child or dependent care expenses for. And if you take 500 and multiply that by 12, you have $6,000. 6000 is the maximum qualifying expense when you have two or more qualifying persons. And that's what we say in the very next paragraph, the dollar limit. The maximum amount of dependent care expense you can claim for the credit is $3,000 for one qualifying person or $6,000 for two or more qualifying persons. Calculating the credit, you must complete Form 2441 to calculate the credit. Your credit is a percentage of your allowable expenses, and the percentage of allowable expenses you can claim varies from a high of 30% to a low of 20%, depending on your AGI. Now, unlike so many other credits out there that actually do phase out completely when your income rises above a certain level, there is no maximum amount of earned income or income you can have to qualify for the child independent care credit. It never phases out completely. You're always allowed to claim it regardless of your income as long as you can show you had earned income and you paid the care so that you could go to work. But it does very quickly, I think, reach that 20% minimum percentage level. The child independent care credit for as long as I've been in this business has never been indexed for inflation, either on the percentage amounts as they relate to income or to the amount of qualifying expense for the child independent care credit, except for a move that we had a few years ago during the Bush administration that took us from a maximum qualifying expense of, I believe it was $2,500 per child up to 3000 So that was a one-time thing, and that's the only adjustment I've ever seen. Now, to claim the credit, you have to fill out Form 2441, and I've got it right here. The final rule is that the credit is limited to your tax. Your child and kid dependent care credit is non-refundable. This means it can reduce your tax to zero, but it cannot generate a refund, and there is no carry-forward provision if you're unable to use it. 
On the form in Part 1, you enter the child care provider's name, you enter the address, you enter the Social Security or EIN of the provider, and then in Box D, you enter the amount paid to the provider. You can see there's two lines provided for providers. If you have more than two providers, you would attach a statement and continue to provide all of the same information for every provider that you paid. Now, separated from Part 1, we have Part 2, and in Part 2, we provide the information for the children for whom, or the dependents for whom, the Child Independent Care Credit was paid. We provide space for the first and last names, the Social Security number, or the ITIN number of the dependent, and finally, the qualifying expense that was paid for that dependent. Then in line three, it says, enter the total amount spent on care minus any amount shown on form W-2, box 10. But do not enter more than $3,000 on line three for one qualifying child or $6,000 for two or more qualifying persons. Underneath all of that, in the area highlighted in yellow, we have line eight. And on line eight, you need to find the adjusted gross income of the filer and then figure the percentage or decimal amount that applies to that filer based on their income. And that's where you can see that if the decimal amount is 35 or 35% 35 of the qualifying expenses, the adjusted gross income has to be $15,000 or less. And by the time the adjusted gross income hits $43,000, you've reached the minimum percentage amount of 20%. Moving up to Part 3 of the form, or on to Page 2 where we have Part 3. If you have a Box 10 on your W-2 showing that there were employer-provided child care benefits, then you must complete Page 2 of the Form 2441. If there are no dependent care benefits provided through your employer, then Page 2 is not necessary. You don't even attach it to the return. But if you do have employer-provided benefits, Page 2 becomes mandatory, and you have to fill it out. And on line 12, you would enter the benefits that are showing in box 10 of your W-2. Then on line 16, you enter the total qualified child care expenses that you had. If the amount on line 12 is less than or equal to the amount on line 16, none of the benefits you received through your employer are taxable. But if the amount on line 16 is less than the amount on line 12, you've got a problem in that some of your benefits could become taxable. And then moving on to the green section, you and your spouse, if married, must have earned income. And on line 18, you enter the amount of your earned income. And on line 19, you enter the amount of your spouse's earned income. And this is where you might have to make a manual entry in the software. If your spouse was incapable of self-care or your spouse was a student for the year and had no earned income because they were a student, line 19 is where you would manually enter the amount of earned income they are deemed to have under that $250 or $500 per month rule. Line 26, if your care expenses were less than your benefits, enter the difference here and the amount on line 26 would then become income to you. So let's look at an illustration of how Form 2441 gets filled out. In this illustration, we have a character named Holly Hobby. Holly Hobby was issued the following W-2 showing dependent care benefits in Box 2. You can see $5,000. Her wages were $25,000, and dependent care benefits were $5,000. Now, during the year, her qualified expenses only totaled $4,800, and $4,800 is less than the $5,000 of dependent care benefits she received. So that tells you that she's going to have taxable income that results from that. And you can see right here on line 7 of her Form 1040, we enter DCB 200, and we're going to add $200 to her wage. But that's not the only thing we need to do. We still need to fill out the 2441, and that comes up on the next page. We begin in Part 1 of the HER Form 2441 by entering the name of the child care provider, the address of the provider, the EIN of the provider, and the amount paid to the provider. Then in part two, we enter the name of the dependent for whom the care was provided, and that was Junior. And you can see that we have qualified expenses as zero. And the reason we have qualified expenses as zero is that we have $5,000 of employer benefits at work that were salary deferred and not taxed. So from Holly's standpoint, she has no qualifying expense for Junior because it's already not been taxed. And in fact, what happens in part three is she shows the amount of benefits that she received from her employer. She shows the amount that she actually paid in expense. And then she shows on line 26 the fact that there's a $200 overage. And that $200 overage is the amount that gets bumped up into her income. And ultimately, she's allowed no child independent care credit. She actually has to include $200 in her income. 
Now, if she fails to attach 2441 to her tax return, and sometimes I see this happen, or even worse, sometimes I see tax preparers who don't notice that the W-2 has employer benefits in Box 10, right? The preparer might go ahead and prepare the 2441 and not tell the computer that there were employer-provided benefits. And when that happens, the computer could give a credit based on $3,000 of qualifying expense for Holly Hobby, and the IRS would then issue that credit as a refund. And then about a year later, Holly Hobby gets a letter from the IRS saying, hey, you didn't report your child and dependent care benefits of $5,000. We want you to pay us some money. So I point that out because... It's a common error. It's a common thing for even the most seasoned tax professionals to simply not notice that box 10 has a number in it. And with that, I'm going to throw up another poll question here. We're working on the problem in the manual. Referring to the information in the course discussion exercise regarding Jack and Sylvia on pages 4 to 6 of the student manual, which of the following statements regarding filing statuses for Jack and Sylvia is true? Sylvia's filing status is head of household and Jack is single, or Jack's filing status is head of household and Sylvia is single, or Jack and Sylvia both qualify for head of household, or neither Jack nor Sylvia qualify as head of household. Hmm, only four of you have answered. Okay, I think that I ran that one home hard enough that most of you get it. Only one of you missed the correct answer. You cannot have two people who are head of household. A house, to be qualified for the head of household filing status, you must pay more than half the cost of keeping up a household for the year. And I told you in the wording of the problem that Jack is the one who paid more than half the cost of keeping up the household. Sylvia did not. Therefore, Sylvia's filing status is single and Jack is head of household. And the next topic of the day is going to be the child tax credit. The child tax credit is an additional tax benefit that may be available to you if you are claiming an exemption deduction for your child. The child tax credit is physically tied to the dependency exemption of your child and unlike the child and dependent care credit, cannot be claimed by a non-custodial parent. Qualifying child for the child and tax credit. To claim the child tax credit, you must have a qualifying child whom you claim as a dependent on your tax return. The definition of a qualifying child for purposes of the child tax credit is similar but not identical to the definition of qualifying child for purposes of determining dependency. To qualify as a qualifying child for the child tax credit, the child must pass all of the following tests. Number one, the child has to be your son, daughter, stepchild, foster child, brother, sister, stepbrother, stepsister, or a descendant of any of them, for example, your grandchild, niece, or nephew. And that child must have been under age 17 at the end of the year and did not provide more than one half of his or her own support, lived with you for more than half the year, there are some exceptions that I'll give you, is claimed as a dependent on your return, does not file a joint return for the year, or if they did, only filed a joint return to claim a refund, and must also have been a U.S. citizen, U.S. national, or a U.S. resident alien. Death or birth of the child. If your child was born or died during the year and was in your home and your home was the child's main home for more than half the time that he or she was alive, your child is considered to have lived with you for more than half the year. Temporary absences. Temporary absences by you or the child for special circumstances such as for school, vacation, business, medical care, military service or detention in a juvenile facility count as time that the child lived with you. If you are claiming a child tax credit or an additional child tax credit for a child identified on your tax return with an ITIN, instead of a social security number or adoption number, you must complete part one of form 8812, and part one asks you questions about each qualifying child to verify that the child was a citizen, national, or resident of the United States. And this is essentially a new requirement. The IRS just introduced that new section to what is now called Schedule 8812 because there were so many instances of individuals who were claiming dependency exemptions for their relatives in Mexico who were then also claiming the child tax credit for those relatives in Mexico, and they were claiming it in error. Because you can see right here 
that in order to claim the child tax credit for a dependent, that dependent must have lived with you for more than half the year. And if you have a relative living in Mexico, you couldn't really say that they were living with you if you're here in the United States. Now, if you're an American citizen living in Mexico and your children are living with you there, there can be an exception to that. But what the IRS has really been burrowing in on are individuals in the United States, very often, sometimes legally, sometimes not legally, filing tax returns with ITINs and then claiming dependents in Mexico with ITINs and even trying to receive refundable additional child tax credits based on ITINs for dependents who live in Mexico. And that's not allowed, and the IRS has been basically focusing on that. Now that we've gone through the rules for the child tax credit, I want to compare those to the rules for claiming a dependent. And you will notice that if you go through the rules for claiming the child tax credit, rules 1 through 7, they're fairly much a match for the rules under the tests to be a qualifying child. But next to the test for qualifying child, we have tests to be a qualifying relative. So the main rule for qualifying child, or the, one of the big differences between qualifying child and qualifying relative, is residency. To claim a qualifying child, you have to have a child that physically lived with you for more than half the year, whereas with qualifying relative, the relative does not need to live with you at all. So let's go through this list. And we spent quite a bit of time talking about this particular table in the course I teach called Filing Requirements, Filing Status, and Dependence. But because people still get confused about the differences between qualifying child for purposes of child tax credit, for purposes of earned income credit, and for purposes of dependency, I felt it would be a good idea to reinforce the rules on dependency so you can notice any subtle differences between that and the child tax credit. So the rules for claiming a dependent state that you cannot claim any dependents if you or your spouse of filing jointly could be claimed as a dependent by another taxpayer. You cannot claim a married person who files a joint return as a dependent unless that joint return is filed only to claim a refund of tax withheld or estimated tax paid. You cannot claim a person as a dependent unless that person is a U.S. citizen, U.S. resident, U.S. national, or a resident of Canada or Mexico. And you cannot claim a person as a dependent unless that person is your qualifying child or qualifying relative. We then go into the test for being a qualifying child. And again, we see they have to be your son, daughter, stepchild, foster child, sister, half-sister, half-brother, stepsister, or a descendant of any of them. And then the child must be under age 19 at the end of the year and younger than you or your spouse if filing jointly, under the age of 24 at the end of the year, a student and younger than you or your spouse if filing jointly, or any age at all if that person is totally and permanently disabled. Well, we can see that's a big difference between the qualifying child for dependency and the qualifying child for child tax credit. For the child tax credit, the child has to be under age 17. And number three, the child must have lived with you for more than half the year. Number four, the child must not have provided more than half of his or her support for the year, and the child is not filing a joint return for the year unless the only reason that they're filing it is to get a refund of tax withheld or estimated tax paid. Now, if the child meets the rules for being a qualifying child of more than one person, only one person can actually treat that child as a qualifying child. And you should see the special rule for qualifying child of more than one person to find out which person is the person who can actually claim that child as a qualifying child. Well, going back to our classwork assignment today, our course discussion with Jack and Sylvia, there's a number of children in that house living with Jack and Sylvia, and our job is to determine which of those children are qualifying children to Jack and which of those children are qualifying children to Sylvia. Now let's go over and look at the qualifying relative side and remember a very important rule, the very first most important rule when we get into the test for qualifying relative. The person whom you are claiming an exemption for under the rules for qualifying relative cannot be your qualifying child or the qualifying child of another taxpayer. So in other words, you could have a person who passes every dependency test there is for qualifying relative, but because that child is a qualifying child of another taxpayer, that child cannot be your qualifying relative. Well, in thinking about Jack and Sylvia, do you see any relations going on in that family where we would have a situation where Jack cannot claim a particular child that is his qualifying relative because that child is the qualifying child of Sylvia and vice versa? The next test under qualifying relative, the person either must be related to you in one of the ways listed under relatives who do not have to live with you, or that person must have lived with you the entire year as a member of your household. 
So some people are under the impression that the only way you can ever claim a dependency exemption for someone is if they live with you. That if they don't live with you, then you can't claim their dependency exemption. And that's not the case at all. What is the case is that if the person does not live with you, you can only claim an exemption for them if they are related to you in one of the ways shown on the table. If they're not related to you in one of the ways shown on the table, then the only way you can claim an exemption for them is if they live with you all year as a member of your household. Is there anyone in Jack and Sylvia's household who meets that definition? And then the person's gross income for the year must be less than $3,800, and you must have provided more than half of that person's total support for the year. And you can see down at the bottom there are exceptions for certain adopted children, exceptions for temporary absences, exception if the person is disabled, and exceptions for multiple support agreements, children of divorced or separated parents, and kidnapped children. The amount of the credit. The maximum amount of child tax credit you can claim is the lesser of your federal tax liability after certain credits, or $1,000 for each qualifying child. If your credit is limited because your tax is less than the credit, you may qualify for the refundable additional child tax credit. There are income limits on the child tax credit, and to my knowledge, these have not been adjusted for inflation since the child tax credit was first introduced way back in 1998. So I'm gradually seeing, at least with my clientele, people are moving away from the credit and that fewer and fewer percentage-wise of my clients are qualifying for it because over time incomes are rising, but as far as I can tell, there's been no indexing for inflation on the child tax credit. If your modified adjusted gross income is above the amount shown below for your filing status, the child tax credit that you can claim will be reduced or eliminated. For a married couple, income in excess of 110000 causes your credit to phase out. Single, head of household, or qualifying widow, the phase out is 75000 and for married filing separately, it's half that of joint, $55,000. Modified adjusted gross income, for purposes of the child tax credit, your modified adjusted gross income is your adjusted gross income plus the following amounts that may apply to you, and those are essentially wage amounts or earned income amounts that have been excluded because you were working in Puerto Rico or a foreign country uh, or American Samoa. If you do not have any of the exclusions under these three categories here, then your AGI for purposes of the child tax credit is the same as your AGI on your tax return. Now, in order to determine if you're subject to a phase-out on the child tax credit and also to determine how much child tax credit you can claim, the IRS provides this tax worksheet. It applies the phase-out limits that you see here. It does a computation to see how much more income that you have than the phase-out, and then it uses that computation to determine the final amount of credit that you are allowed to claim. And then down at the bottom, it also figures out how much credit might be available as an additional child tax credit by telling you how much to subtract from your calculations for the additional child tax credit. Children of divorced or separated parents or for parents that lived apart, in most cases because of the residency test, a child of divorced or separated parents is the qualifying child of the custodial parent. However, the child will be treated as the qualifying child of the non-custodial parent if all four of the following t statements are true. And I do want to point out this word here, non-custodial parent. Jack and Sylvia, neither of them are non-custodial parents. They're custodial parents because they both lived together. All of the children lived with them both equally throughout the year. So if you're reading through this list with me, none of the exceptions for a non-custodial parent would apply with respect to Jack and Sylvia. So a child will be treated as the qualifying child of the non-custodial parent if all four of the following statements are true. Number one, the parents are divorced or legally separated under decree of divorce or separate maintenance, are separated under a written separation agreement, or lived apart at all times during the last six months of the year, whether or not they were ever married. The child received over half of his or her support for the year from the parents and not someone else. The child is in the custody of one or both parents for more than half of the year, not someone else. And either of the following statements is true. The custodial parent signs a written declaration or Form 8332 that he or she will not claim the child as a dependent for the year, and the non-custodial parent attaches that written declaration to his or her return. Or there was a pre-1985 divorce decree in effect, but that's going to kind of not apply to many of us, is it? So essentially, there has to be a written declaration attached to the return. Either 8332, 
a similar statement that contains the same information as 8332 or certain pages of the divorce decree if the divorce decree went into effect before 2009. The custodial parent and the non-custodial parent defined, if you're ever wondering who's who. The custodial parent is the parent with whom the child lived the greater part of the night during the year. The other parent is the non-custodial parent. So if the question is, do we count days or nights? <laughs> IRS says in most cases, you count the nights that the child slept in a bed in your house. The parents are divorced or separated during the year. If the parents divorced or separated during the year and the child lived or with both parents before the separation, the custodial parent is the one with whom the child lived for the greater number of nights during the rest of the year. Where the child sleeps. The child is treated as living with the parent for a night if the child sleeps at the parent's home, whether or not the parent is present, or in the company of the parent when the child does not sleep at the parent's home. For example, the parent and the child are on vacation together. Equal number of nights. If the child lived with each parent for an equal number of nights during the year, then the custodial parent is the parent with the highest adjusted gross income. Absences. If a child was not with either parent on a particular night, because, for example, the child was staying at a friend's house, the child is treated as living with the parent with whom the child normally would have lived with for that night, except for the fact that they were away. But if it cannot be determined with which parent that child normally would have lived, then the child is not considered to have lived with either parent that night. Parents work at night. If due to a parent's nighttime work schedule, a child lives for a greater number of days but not nights with the parent who works at night, that parent is treated as the custodial parent. On a school day, the child is treated as living at the primary residence registered with the school. Here are some examples, and these are not my examples. These come out of the IRS publications. I don't think it's Pub 17. It's a different one on the child tax credit. But at any rate, these are not my own illustrations. They're IRS's. Example number one, the child lived with one parent for a greater number of nights. You and your child's other parent are divorced. In 2012, your child lived with you 210 nights and with the other parent 156 nights. You are the custodial parent. Example number two, your child is away at camp. In 2012, your daughter lives with each parent on alternate weeks. In the summer, she spends six weeks at summer camp, and during the time she was at camp, she is treated as living with you for three weeks and the other parent, your ex-spouse, for three weeks because this is how long she would have lived with each of you if she had not attended summer camp. Child lived the same number of nights with each parent. Your son lived with you exactly 180 nights during the year and the exact same 180 nights, different nights of course, with your ex-spouse. Therefore, neither of you can win under the greater number of nights test. So instead, we look at the adjusted gross income and your adjusted gross income is 40,000, your spouse's AGI is 25,000 and therefore you are treated as custodial. Example number four, the child is at the parent's home but with the other parent. Your son normally lives with you during the week and with his other parent, your ex-spouse, every other weekend. You become ill and you are hospitalized. The other parent lives in your home with your son for 10 consecutive days while you are in a hospital. Your son is treated as living with you during this 10-day period because he was living in your home. Example number five, child is emancipated. If the child turned age 18 during the year, they become emancipated on that day, and the custodial relationships are no longer apply. So they have a date here. If the child turns age 18 in May, he became emancipated under the laws of the state where he lives. As a result, he is not considered in the custody of his parents for more than half the year, and a special rule for children of divorced or separated parents does not apply. Then they have a separate test here where the child becomes emancipated in August, and the child lived with you from January through May and then with her other parent, your ex-spouse, from June on, but the child became emancipated in August. And so even though the child appeared to be with the other parent for more time during the year, the child actually was with you for more time well, before the emancipation date, and therefore you still win. Remarried parent, if you remarry, the support provided by your new spouse is treated as support by you and parents who were never married. The rule for divorced or separated parents also applies to parents who were never married and lived apart at all times during the last six months of the year. So that concludes the look at the child tax credit, some of the rules for dependency and the child independent care credit. I'll put up some poll questions 
relating to Jack and Sylvia, and you can use the period of the break to think your way through some of the problems you see in the manual. And this is not a multiple choice question you see coming up here. It says, referring to the course discussion exercise on the pages of the student manual, what is the amount of child care credit that you calculate for Sylvia? So see what you can figure for Sylvia's child care credit and tell me what you think it is. And the same thing for Jack. What is his child care credit? Chick. C-H-I-C-K. Chick. And what we have is pretty much everyone got the answer correct for Jack. Which children meet the qualifying child test with respect to Jack? Well, George, Samantha, and Becky are all qualifying children of Jack. And so for those of you who selected that as the correct answer, you're spot on. For Sylvia, Ben and Becky are both qualifying children of Sylvia. Ben is also Sylvia's child, but so is Becky. And so the correct answer is C for that question. Going up to the top of the screen, it says, referring to the course discussion exercise in the manual, what is the amount of child care credit you calculated for Sylvia? And you can see that we've been given a response of 700, a response of zero, a response of 725. The answer is actually anywhere between zero and $725 for Sylvia. And for Jack, the correct answer is actually $145. I do see someone answered $500, and that is the amount of expense that Jack had, but it's not the amount of credit that he had. And when we talk about a question like this, what is the amount of child care credit you calculate for Jack? If you were in an exam situation, you would have answered the question incorrectly. You would have gone to the correct information, but you would not have interpreted the question correctly, and therefore you get the wrong answer. So let's just go about, for a minute, returning to the top of the manual and looking at the information I provided for you on these dependents with respect to child and dependent care expenses so we can see why it is that we're getting the calculations on the child and dependent care credit that we do. So in the wording of the problem here, I tell you that Jack's earned income is $26,000 and that he paid $500 of after-school care for George during the year. And I tell you that Sylvia's income is $27,000 and that she paid $2,500 of child care expense for Becky during the year. So in what situation would Sylvia's child care expense drop to zero? Well, her child care expense or her allowable credit would drop to zero if she releases Becky's dependency exemption to Jack. Because in order for Sylvia to claim a child and dependent care credit for Becky, she also has to claim Becky's dependency exemption. But let's assume that she does claim Becky's dependency exemption, then we also have to get to the point where we've determined whether or not Sylvia even has a tax liability. And depending on which children she claims, she may or may not have a tax liability. One of the scenarios I calculate are actually two different scenarios, depending on legal deductions that Sylvia could claim for all of the dependents available to her. Her tax gets to zero before she even figures the child and dependent care credit. And if that was the case, based on the dependents that she's claiming, she wouldn't even get a child and dependent care credit. Under another scenario, where we take away some of the dependents so that Jack can have them, we get a situation where Sylvia's child and dependent care credit can be either $588 or a high of $745. So how do we get $745? Because that's the most child and dependent care credit she can claim. Well, we get that by taking $2,500 and multiplying it by the decimal amount for her income level. So if we go to the table... So we have the table on the form right here. Where does $27,000 fall on this form? Well, $27,000 falls on this line. Is your income over $25,000 but not over $27,000? That's Sylvia. Her income is $27,000, and so her decimal amount is 0 0.29. And for Jack, his income is over $25,000, but it is not more than $27,000, so he also falls in the decimal factor of 0 0.29. So if you take $2,500... For Sylvia, assuming she's claiming Becky as her dependent, 
and multiply that by 0.29, you get $725. So that is the correct answer for Sylvia. And then on Jack, if you take his $500, assuming he is able to claim a dependency exemption for the child that he paid that for, then you're going to go 500 times 0.29 and you get the ch maximum child care credit that he could qualify for as well. And for Jack, that ends up being $145. So there are the calculations on the maximum amount. But again, it isn't enough to calculate the credit. Jack and Sylvia also must claim the dependency exemption for the child on which they pay the expense, and they have to be in a situation where they have a positive tax liability. So we'll see as we go through the answer key for Jack and Sylvia towards the end of today's class how we can end up in a situation where Sylvia has no tax and doesn't benefit from her credit at all, or perhaps she doesn't claim Becky's dependency exemption and therefore she has no credit at all in that situation. And then in a third situation, her tax is more than zero but less than 725, and so she gets a reduced child independent care credit. And the next topic of the day is the adoption credit. The adoption credit is not new. It's been around a long time, but the government keeps playing around with it just to make it a little confusing by changing the rules <laughs> periodically. And we went through a period in 2010 where it was refundable, and IRS scrutiny of the credit went up astronomically because of the fact that it became refundable. But for 2012, it is again a non-refundable credit. The adoption credit is intended to offset qualified adoption expenses, making adoption possible for some families who could not otherwise afford it. Taxpayers who adopt an eligible child may qualify for an adoption tax credit. The credit was originally set to expire at the end of 2010, but the Patient Protection and Affordable Care Act, also known as the Affordable Care Act, extended the credit through 2011 and made it refundable for 2010 and 11. The credit remains available in 2012, however, it is now non-refundable again. And also, it was set to expire at the end of 2012, but it was extended with the Taxpayer Relief Act of 2012, and now finally is permanent. So we can look at this credit as something that's not going to go away and maybe not be here for the future. Uh, it is now permanent. There are some rules for claiming the credit. You may qualify for the adoption credit if you adopted or attempted to adopt an eligible child and paid qualified expenses relating to the adoption. The following rules apply to the credit. The amount of the tax credit is as much as $12,650 for 2012. If the credit is greater than your tax, you can carry forward any unused credit for up to five years. So the adoption credit is one of the few credits where IRS does allow for a carry forward. If you adopt a special needs child, you may qualify for the full amount of the adoption credit, even if you paid few or no adoption-related expenses for the year. The maximum exclusion from income for benefits under your employer's adoption assistance program is $12,650. What that means is if you have an employer who wants to provide payment for your adoption expenses for you, your employer can do that. And the IRS says that that would be a tax-free benefit to you as long as the employer does not pay more than $12,650. The maximum amount of adoption credit or employer-provided adoption expense that you are allowed to receive is phased out if your modified adjusted gross income is between 189710 and 229710 And you cannot claim the credit or the exclusion if your modified AGI goes over $229,710. Your filing status cannot be married filing separate in the year the qualifying expenses for the adoption are at first allowable unless you file an amended return for the year within the period of time allowed under the statute of limitation. And generally that would mean three years from the original due date of the return. Eligible child, you can claim a credit of up to $12,650 for the qualifying expenses you pay to adopt an eligible child. And an eligible child is any individual who is under age 18 or physically or mentally incapable of self-care. You cannot claim the credit if you adopted your spouse's child. I can remember many years ago I had a client come to me and they were the first client I'd ever had who had adoption expenses and they wanted to claim an adoption credit. And in interviewing them I established that they had adopted their spouse's child and something in my head just rang off alarm bells that that would probably be a reason why it was disallowed and that was exactly the case. You cannot claim a credit if you adopted your spouse's child. 
adoption of U.S. children who have been determined by a state to have a special need. If you adopt a U.S. child that a state has determined has special needs, you may be able to claim the maximum amount of the credit or the exclusion for the year the adoption is finalized, even if you paid no qualified adoption expenses. A child is considered special needs for purposes of the adoption credit if all of the following conditions are met. Number one, the child was a U.S. citizen or resident when the adoption effort began. So in other words, the special need adoption rule does not apply to foreign adoptions. You have to be adopting American children. A state determines that the child cannot or should not be returned to his or her parent's home, and a state determines that the child probably would not be adopted unless assistance is provided to the adoptive family. The adoption credits definition of children with special needs is narrower than the definitions of special needs for other purposes in the following ways. For purposes of the adoption credit, foreign children are not considered to be special needs. Additionally, many U.S. children who have disabilities are not considered special needs for purposes of the adoption credit. Generally, special needs adoptions are the adoptions of children whom a state's child welfare agency considers difficult to place for adoption. Most foster care adoptions are special needs adoptions, but few other adoptions are considered to be special needs adoptions. Qualified adoption expenses. Unless you adopted a special needs child, you must have paid qualified adoption expenses. And qualified adoption expenses are the reasonable and necessary costs of adopting a child. Qualified adoption expense for both the credit and the exclusion can include adoption fees, court costs, attorney fees, traveling expenses, including amounts spent for meals and lodging while traveling away from home. So let's just suppose you travel to China to adopt a child, and the Chinese government requires that you spend two weeks or three weeks in China as a part of that adoption. Well, that would be a legitimate and allowable adoption expense. Other expenses directly related to and for the principal purpose of the legal adoption of the eligible child, and also expenses paid in an unsuccessful attempt to adopt an eligible child before finalizing the adoption of another child, that can qualify for the credit. However, expenses connected with a foreign adoption where the child is not a U.S. citizen or resident at the time the adoption process began qualify only if you actually adopt the child. So in other words, if you attempt to adopt a child here in the United States, a child that is a resident of the United States, and that adoption fails, all of the costs that you put into adopting that child are going to be allowed if you eventually successfully adopt another child. But if you make an attempt to adopt a child outside of the United States, a foreign adoption, and that adoption falls through, and then later on you will successfully adopt another foreign child, the adoption costs related with the first failed adoption are not allowable, only the costs associated with the successful adoption. Qualified adoption expenses do not include, and you may not claim any of the following expenses, the costs of adopting your spouse's child for a surrogate parenting arrangement that violates state or federal law, that are paid using funds received from a federal, state, or local program, that are paid or reimbursed by your employer or any other organization, or are allowed as a credit or a deduction on a federal return. When to take the credit or the exclusion? Well, when you take the credit or exclusion depends on whether you adopted a child who is a U.S. citizen or resident or if you adopted a foreign child. So firstly, we have a table that applies to a child who is a U.S. citizen or resident. And if the eligible child is a U.S. citizen or resident, you can take the adoption credit or exclusion even if the adoption never becomes final. You take the credit or exclusion as shown here. You can see it says if you pay the qualified adoption expenses in, any year before the year the adoption becomes final, then you take the credit in the year after the year of the payment. And if you pay the expenses in the year the adoption becomes final, then you take them in the year the adoption becomes final. If you pay the expenses in any year after the year the adoption becomes final, then you take the expenses in the year of payment. And if your employer pays for qualifying expenses under an adoption assistance program in any year, then you take the exclusion in the year of the payment foreign child. If the eligible child is not a U.S. citizen or resident, you cannot take the adoption credit or exclusion unless the adoption becomes final. Take the credit or exclusion as shown in the following table. If you pay the qualifying expenses in any year before the year the adoption becomes final, then you take the expense in the year that the adoption becomes final. 
If you pay the expense in the year the adoption becomes final, you claim the expense in the year the adoption becomes final. And if you pay the expense in any year after the year the adoption becomes final, you take the expense in the year of the payment. Note that if your employer makes a payment in a year before the adoption of a foreign child is final, you include the amount in your income for the year. And then when the adoption is final, you exclude the amount from your income on your return for that year. So in other words, if you are incurring adoption expenses for the adoption of a child and your employer pays those adoption expenses for you, and it's an American adoption, even if the adoption does not become final in that year, the exclusion would still apply. But if your employer is providing money towards the adoption of a foreign child and before the end of that year that adoption is not finalized, your W-2 is going to need to reflect that adoption expense that was paid for you. And then if in the following year that adoption is finalized, it's the following year that you would be able to take the reduced income exclusion on your tax return. So more on the exclusion from income for employer-paid expenses. If you receive adoption assistance benefits from your employer, you may be able to exclude all or part from your taxable income up to $12,650, but you cannot claim both a credit and an exclusion for the same expense. But the meaning of this sentence may not be exactly what you're thinking, and let's see why. We have an adoption credit and an exclusion that are both limited to $12,650 for the year. The adoption and the exclusion are each limited to a specific dollar amount for each effort to adopt an eligible child. The dollar limit for a particular year may be reduced by the amount of qualified adoption expenses used in the previous years for the same adoption effort. Not necessarily the same child if you have a failed effort, but there's one single attempt to adopt a child over time. Maybe you start with this child and end up with another child, but there's that one attempt. And maybe after that attempt is finalized, you attempt to adopt another child and you move on to the next adoption. So for each adoption attempt, where there legitimately is an attempt to adopt a child that ultimately ends in a successful adoption, you're going to be allowed the credit or the exclusion or perhaps both. And here's an example. Expenses that were paid in 2011 and 12. Chad paid $3,000 of adoption expenses in connection with a domestic adoption in 2010. He claimed $3,000 credit for those 2010 expenses on his 2011 return because 2011 is the year following the year the expenses were paid. He then paid an additional $12,650 of qualified expenses in 2012 when the adoption became final. The maximum credit that Chad can claim on his 2012 return will be $9,650 because you're going to have to subtract the $3,000 credit he claimed in 2011 from the maximum overall credit for 2012. The exclusion and the credit are applied separately. The dollar limitation applies separately to both the credit and the exclusion. You may be able to claim both the credit and the exclusion for qualified expenses paid in adopting a child subject to the following rules. Any allowable exclusion must be claimed before any allowable credit is claimed. Any exclusion of expenses reduces the amount of expenses available for the credit and you cannot claim both the credit and the exclusion for the same expense, but you could claim them for the same child. And here's some illustrations. Employer reimbursement reimbuses the amount of the credit. In 2012, Hal paid $12,650 of qualified adoption expenses in connection with finalizing the adoption of an eligible child. His employer reimbursed him $2,650 of those expenses. His adoption credit will be limited to $10,000 as follows. He subtracts $2,650 from his gross income from 2012 and he claims the remaining $10,000 as a credit. In illustration number two, the employer reimbursement is in addition to the credit. In this illustration, the facts are the same as in illustration one, except Hal paid $17,650 of qualified adoption expenses and his employer reimbursed him for $5,000 of those expenses. Assuming all other requirements are met, he can exclude the $5,000 his employer reimbursed him and he can also claim a credit of $12,650. Then in illustration number three, the reimbursement and the credit are both allowed in full. The facts are the same as in illustration one, except this time Hal paid $30,000 of qualified expenses, of which $12,650 were reimbursed by his employer. And assuming all of the requirements are met, he can exclude the $12,650 of reimbursement he gets from his employer, and he can also claim a credit of $12,650. 
but the remaining $4,700 of expenses, which is $30,000 minus $12,650 minus another $12,650, cannot be used for either an exclusion or a credit. Filing status. You may claim the adoption credit using any of the following filing statuses. And of course, you can see married filing separate is consistently missing from these lists. And again, it is here. You must be single, qualifying widow, married filing joint, or head of household. You cannot claim the adoption credit or exclusion for a year that your filing status is married filing separately. However, if your filing status for a later year is married filing joint, you may qualify for expenses you paid for that year. And here's an illustration. We have married filing separate who cannot claim the adoption credit. John and Rose paid the following qualifying adoption costs in connection with the adoption of their child, which was finalized in 2012. In 2010, they had 3,000 of expenses. In 2011, they had 4,000 of expenses. And in 2012, they paid $5,000 of expenses. John and Rose filed their 2010 and 2011 returns using the married filing separate statuses. For 2012, they will file jointly. Now, under the rules for domestic adoptions, an adoption expense is deductible as follows. It's deductible in the year following the year of payment if the adoption is not yet finalized. And it's deductible in the year paid if paid in the year the adoption is finalized. And it's deductible in the year paid if paid in the year after the year it is finalized. Well, John and Rose's filing status for 2010 is actually irrelevant. They filed separately in 2010, and they had expenses in 2010, but they couldn't have claimed them on their 2010 return anyway because the adoption was not final. And when you pay expenses in a year earlier than the adoption becomes final, you claim those expenses in the year after the year you pay them. So what that means is that these 2010 expenses of $3,000 only became eligible for the credit in 2011. But in 2011, they filed separately. So for 2011, they will not be able to claim the $3,000 of expense that was paid in 2010. Now, the $4,000 that was paid in 11, that also cannot be claimed on the 11 return. Even if they filed jointly, they couldn't claim it because it was paid in 11 and the option wasn't finalized. But they filed separately in 2011. And in terms of the $4,000, it doesn't really matter because the $4,000 is claimed in the year after the year of payment or the year the adoption is finalized. And that was 2012. So really, the $4,000 paid in 11 and the $5,000 paid in 12 will both apply to the 2012 return. And since they filed jointly in 2012, it means they will get to claim an adoption credit based on $9,000 of qualified expense. Documentation. For adoption credits claimed for tax years 2010 and 11, it was necessary to attach documentation to a paper filed copy of the tax return. You couldn't e-file for those two years. But for 2012, you do not mail documentation with the return, and instead you should keep those documents that support your claim for the adoption credit with your records. And you should keep the following documents with your tax records. Receipts for qualified adoption expenses. Entry visas for foreign adoptions the final decree certificate or order of adoption, home study by an authorized placement agency, child placement agreements or court orders, and determination of special needs status by a state or the District of Columbia. How do you go about claiming the credit? Well, you do so by completing Form 8839 and attaching it to your return. You figure the credit, and then you enter the amount of the credit on line 53 of your return in checkbox C. And here we have an illustration. Cindy sometime finalized the adoption of her daughter, Sandy Sanders. The adoption was a special needs child, and Cindy has no expenses for the adoption. Cindy will file Form 8839 to claim the credit, and she will file as head of household. Her W-2 shows her only income for the year, and it's $79,000 with $15,000 $15, of withholding. Go ahead and prepare her return as follows. Well, we have Form 8839 attached, and on it we enter the name of the child, the year of the child's birth, the fact that the child was special needs, we check the appropriate box, we enter the child's social security number, and then check if the adoption became final in 2012 or an earlier year, and in this case it became final in 2012. Then we enter the maximum amount of child adoption credit that can be claimed, and that's $12,650. And then it asks, were there any prior year amounts claimed for that child under the adoption credit? And the answer is no. So we're done. 12650 is the maximum potential adoption credit. 
We then move on to line seven and enter Cindy's adjusted gross income. The purpose of doing that is to see if she's subject to a phase out. And based on her income, she is not subject to a phase out. She'll be allowed to claim her credit in full. However, her credit cannot be more than her tax. And when you prepare Cindy's tax return using $79,000 of wage, the head of household filing status, and claiming an exemption deduction for herself and an exemption deduction for her adopted child, Sandy, she ends up with only a $12,650 tax liability. And as such, she ends up with only a $10,326 tax liability, and her credit cannot be more than her liability. So ultimately, the adoption credit she will claim for 2012 is $10,326, which means she will have a $2,324 carry forward to 2013. So that completes the review of the adoption credit rules. And we're now on to the earned income credit. And we could call the earned income credit the mother of all <laughs> tax credits. It is the most exciting of the credits in terms of what our clients have to say about it, I think. When we have clients that qualify for the earned income credit, they're usually coming in early in the tax season, and it's a little bit like Christmas time. They're all excited about getting their refunds, and it really is a boon to a great number of people. But at the same time, it's also a subject of great concern on the part of our government because literally billions of dollars every year of tax revenues go out to people who are not legitimately entitled to the credit. The IRS is really stuck. It's charged with the responsibility of making sure that every person who's entitled to the earned income credit gets it. And for that reason, they actually promote the credit. They advertise it. They reach out to lower income communities trying to reach people to let them know that they can qualify for this credit. And at the same time, they're also charged with the responsibility of making sure that people who are not entitled to it don't get it. And where do you fall in the middle of that as a tax practitioner? Well, your duty, your obligation, the requirements placed on you under the law as a tax practitioner are that you are required to know the law with respect to the earned income credit, and you are required to exercise due diligence in your efforts to award it. And you can be guilty of negligence by not giving the credit when you are supposed to, and you can also be guilty of negligence when you give the credit when you're not allowed to. So let's get into it. So the earned income credit is refundable credit that is designed to help working low income to moderate income individuals and families. We have earned income is in the title of it, right? Earned income credit. <laughs> and the term earned income means you must have worked during the year to be eligible for the credit. You have to have earned your living. <laughs> by working in the form of wage income, self-employment, or active participation in a partnership. There are rules for taxpayers who do not have qualifying children, and there are separate rules for taxpayers who do have qualifying children. If you do not have a qualifying child, you must meet all of the following tests to claim the credit. The total earned income, as well as your adjusted gross income, must be less than $13,980, or $19,190 if you are filing a joint return. Your adjusted gross income is the amount that shows on line 37 of your Form 1040 or on the equivalent lines of your 1040A or EZ. Now, one of the things that I do run into with the earned income credit for taxpayers who do not have a qualifying child is that tax preparers sometimes muddle the rules that you see under this category with the rules under this category. And for example, you might have a taxpayer who does have a qualifying child, but the tax preparer is applying rules for taxpayers who don't have qualifying children. And in particular, a rule that I see confusing preparers regularly is this age requirement. I have seen preparers, even working for me over the past 20 years, deny the earned income credit to a person who has a qualifying child because that person was under age 25. But this age rule here applies only when the taxpayer does not have a qualifying child. So if you do not have a qualifying child, your income has to be below the amount shown here, but also you must be age 25, but not age 65. So you have to be at least age 25, but you must still be under age 65. And you cannot be the dependent or the qualifying child of another person. And you must have lived in the United States for more than half the year. Both you and your spouse, if filing jointly, must have a valid Social Security number. 
Your filing status cannot be married filing separately. You must have been a U.S. citizen or a resident alien for the entire year. You cannot file Form 2555 or 2555-EZ relating to the foreign earned income exclusion. Your investment income must be $3,200 or less, and you must have earned income. Rules for taxpayers who do have qualifying children. If you have one or more qualifying children, you must meet all of the following rules to claim the credit. Your total earned income, as well as your adjusted gross income, must be less than the amount shown here based on how many qualifying children you have. If you have one qualifying children, your income must be less than 36920 or less than 42130 if you are filing joint. Or if you have two or more qualifying children, or two, two children, then the income must be less than 41952 or 47162 if joint. And if you have three or more qualifying children, then the income must be less than 45060 or less than 50270 if joint. Well, back in the early days when I first got into this business, if your income hit about $20,000, $25,000, you were pretty much out of the realm of the earned income credit. But the earned income credit has been adjusted for inflation over time, and so each year the level of income people can have and still receive the credit is going up. But in addition, a special provision in place, and I believe it now will go through the end of 2017, allows for a maximum number of qualifying children for purposes of the earned income credit of three children. That's up from where it was for most of history with just two children. And also the income has gone up when you have three children. So we really are dealing with quite moderate levels of income here where you can still perhaps be getting some earned income credit and not just in the olden days where I think of the credit applying really only to lower income families with children. Your child must meet the relationship age, residency, and joint return tests. Your qualifying child cannot be used by more than one person to claim the earned income credit. You cannot be the qualifying child of another person. You, your spouse, if filing jointly, and your qualifying child must all have valid Social Security numbers. Your filing status cannot be married filing separately. You must have been a U.S. citizen or a resident alien all year. You cannot file Form 2555. Your investment income must be $3,200 or less, and you must have earned income. So let's go through these tests up here. Your child must pass the relationship, age, residency, and joint return tests. And the first of these is the relationship test. Your child must be your son, daughter, stepchild, adopted child, eligible foster child, or descendant of any of them. For example, a grandchild. Or that person must be your brother, sister, stepbrother, or stepsister, half-brother, half-sister, a descendant of any of them, for example, a niece or a nephew. Note that an eligible foster child must have been placed with you by an authorized agency in order to be an eligible foster child. Age test. Your child must be under age 19 at the end of 2012 and younger than you or your spouse if you are filing jointly, or under the age of 24 at the end of the year, a student and younger than you or your spouse if filing jointly, or the child could have been any age so long as they were permanently and totally disabled. So what is a student? Well, to qualify as a student, your child must be during some part of each of any five calendar months during the year a full-time student at a school that has a regular teaching staff course of study and a regular student body, or a student taking a full-time on-farm training course given by a school described above, or a state, county, or local government. Note that the five calendar months do not need to be consecutive. So let's just suppose you have a child that finished school in May. They finished high school in May. So they turned 19 during the year, and they finished high school in May. So that means that they would have been a full-time student, assuming they were in high school, for all of January, February, March, April, and May. So they've met that five-month test. Now, if the child continues to live at home for the remainder of the year, even though they're 19 and they're no longer in school, it doesn't mean that they're not your qualifying child, but not just for dependency, but also for the earned income credit. Not the child tax credit because they're too old for that, but for dependency and the earned income credit, you have a child who does still qualify even though they finish school and they're age 19. Now the flip side might be maybe you have a child who finished school in May at age 19. We clock through to the next year and they don't go to school anymore in 2012. But come 2013, that child 
finally enrolls in school with the fall term in September. We've got September, October, November, December. That is not five months. They were full-time for four months, but not for five months, so that child would not qualify under that scenario for 2013. But alternatively, let's just say your child graduated from high school at age 19 in 2012, did not attend any more school for 2012, went to school for a few months during the year, but maybe they went for a couple of months in the spring term, and then they went for four more months in the fall term. Even though they're not consecutive months, what matters is that the child was full-time for at least some part in each of five months during the year, and if your child can meet those tests, then the child is considered to be a student. And finally, a full-time student, if you're wondering what the definition of a full-time student is, a full-time student is whatever the school decides is full-time. So the school that your child is attending, what does that school define as full-time? If they're attending a credit load, is a full credit load 12 credits? Is it 8 credits? Is it 20 credits? What does the school think is full-time? And if your child meets the school's definition of full-time, then your child is full-time. And do note that that is full-time, not half-time. Because when we're talking about the education credits, in order to claim the American Opportunity Credit, the student must be half-time or better. But in order for a child to qualify for the Earned Income Credit, when that child is age 19 but less than 24, that child has to be full-time. The next test we have is the joint return test. To meet this test, the child cannot file a joint return for the year. There is an exception to the joint return test if your child and his or her spouse file a joint return merely to claim a refund, and if they filed separately or didn't file at all, they wouldn't owe any tax. Residency test. Your child must have lived with you in the United States for more than six months during 2012, and the United States means the 50 states and the District of Columbia, but it does not include Puerto Rico or U.S. possessions such as Guam. Homeless shelter. Your home can be any location where you regularly live, and you do not need a traditional home. For example, your child lived with you for more than half the year in one or more homeless shelters. Your child meets the residency test. Military personnel stationed outside of the United States. U.S. military personnel stationed outside of the United States on extended active duty are considered to live in the United States during that duty period for purposes of the Earned Income Credit. So if you have a client who's stationed in Germany, they're on a permanent duty station assignment in Germany for a period of three years, the entire time that they're in Germany on that permanent duty assignment, they are considered to be residents of the United States for purposes of the Earned Income Credit. If the child was born or died during the year, then that child is treated as having lived with you for all of 2012 if your home was the child's home for the period of time he or she was alive. Temporary absences. You count time that your child was away from home on a temporary absence due to special circumstances as time that the child lived with you. And examples of special circumstance include illness, school attendance, business, vacation, military service, and even detention in a juvenile facility. Kidnapped child. A kidnapped child is treated as living with you for more than half of the year if the child lived with you for more than half of the part of the year before the date of the kidnapping. The child must be presumed by law enforcement authorities to have been kidnapped by someone who is not a member of your family or the child's family. The treatment applies to all years until the child is returned. However, the last year this treatment can apply is the earlier of the year that there is a determination that the child is dead or the year that the child would have reached the age of 18. If your qualifying child has been kidnapped and meets these requirements, enter KC instead of a number on line 6 of Schedule EIC. Well, line 6 of Schedule EIC is where you write down the number of months that the child lived with you. So if your child didn't live with you because they'd been kidnapped, you would write KC instead of a number of months. Valid Social Security Card. Unless your child was born and died during the year, you and your spouse if filing a joint return and your child must all have valid Social Security numbers. You cannot claim the Earned Income Credit if you or your spouse if you're filing jointly or your qualifying child's Social Security number is missing or incorrect on your tax return. Now I should point out, that it is possible that you are filing a joint return with your spouse, and both you and your spouse have valid Social Security numbers, and that you have three dependents, and one of those dependents has a valid Social Security number, but the other two do not. 
Well, the fact that you have two dependents who do not have valid Social Security numbers would not prevent you from qualifying for earned income credit on the one child that does. But if you have a tax return situation where the, the taxpayer has a valid Social Security number but the spouse does not, and all three children have valid Social Security numbers, the fact that the spouse does not have a valid Social Security number means that you cannot have earned income credit on any of the children. I've always thought that was a rather unfair rule, but it is nonetheless a rule. You or your spouse or your qualifying child's Social Security card, if the card says not valid for employment and the card was issued only for purposes of getting a federally funded benefit, you do not qualify for earned income credit even though you have a card. And if you or your spouse are filing jointly or your ITIN has an ITIN or an ATIN, which is an adoption taxpayer identification number, in place of a Social Security number, you don't get earned income credit. And all ITINs, by the way, begin with a 9. If you are looking at a tax return that your client has brought you, they're a new client to you and they, they have a tax return and they're showing it to you and you're looking at it, and you can see that the Social Security number of the taxpayer, the spouse, or any of the children begins with a digit 9. That tells you that that number is an ITIN because all ITINs always begin with 9s. Your qualifying child cannot be used by more than one person to claim the earned income credit. If two or more people qualify to claim the same child, only one may claim that child. Who will actually claim the child? You can agree between yourselves who will claim the child. However, if a parent can claim the child as a qualifying child, but no parent claims the child, the child is treated as the qualifying child with the person who has the highest adjusted gross income for the year but only if that person's adjusted gross income is higher than the highest AGI of any of the child's parents who can claim the child. So what they're saying here is let's just suppose you've got a household. I'm going to draw up a little chart here. So let's just suppose we have three people living in a house together. We've got mom, dad, grandma, and kid. Those are the people living in the house. And mom and dad are living in grandma's house, and they're thinking, well, I want to give the dependency exemption to grandma. And when I give away the dependency exemption to grandma, I'm, by the way, I'm going to be giving away perhaps entitlement to the head of household filing status. I'm going to be giving away the dependency exemption. I'm going to be giving away the child and dependent care credit, the child tax credit, and the earned income credit all at one time. But maybe there's a reason to want to do that. Mom and dad have decided to give the kid to grandma for tax purposes. Can they do that? The answer is yes, but only if grandma's income is higher than their mom or dad's income. Well, actually, than both their income. So if mom or dad have higher income than grandma, grandma cannot claim the child. But with, between mom and dad, either of them can claim the child, and it doesn't need to be the one with the highest income. Mom can claim the child even if her income is lower. But if her income is lower than dad, then dad has to basically give permission to mom because he would win under the tiebreaker rules. And of course, I'm assuming in this scenario that mom and dad are not married because if they were married, then they would need to file a joint return and claim that child together. But even so, whether they're married or not, grandma can only claim the credit if her income is higher than both mom and dad. So if the child's parents file a joint return with each other, this rule can be applied by treating the parent's total AGI as divided evenly between them. You can decide who will claim the child, or if both of you cannot agree who will claim the child, the tiebreaker rules shall determine who can claim the child. So let's take a look at the tiebreaker rules. The tiebreaker rules apply if you cannot agree on who will claim the child. And the IRS essentially applies the tiebreaker rules if two people file tax returns claiming the same child. And then there's a fight going on. The IRS sends out letters saying, you claimed this child. You also claimed the same child. Only one of you can claim the child. Can you sort it out between you? If the answer is no and you're both fighting over it, the IRS is going to apply the tiebreaker rules to decide who can do it. And under the tiebreaker rules, the child can be treated as a qualifying child only by the parent if only one of the persons is the child's parents. So let's just suppose mom and dad between them agree to let grandma claim the kid. And then later on, mom and dad, or mom or dad, decide to file and claim that child as a dependent. Grandma's out of it, even though she was given permission, and even though her income is higher, once a parent claims a child and it comes down to a fight, the IRS will always award the child to the parent. 
All right, the parent with whom the child lived for the longest period of time during the year if both of the persons are the child's parents. So under the tiebreaker rules, if the child lived with the parents during the year, the parent who had the child for the longer period of time automatically wins. But if both parents lived with the child the same amount of time, then the parent with the highest adjusted gross income will win under the tiebreaker rules if the child lived with the parents the same amount of time. And then finally, if neither of the persons claiming the child is the child's parent, the IRS will award that child to the person who has the highest adjusted gross income. The tax benefits for a child can only be claimed by one person. The person who claims the child for earned income credit must also be the person who claims the child for all of the following. The exemption deduction, the child tax credit, the head of household filing status, the credit for child and dependent care expenses, and the exclusion of dependent care benefits from W-2 income. There's only one exception to this rule. If the non-custodial parent is entitled to the child's dependency exemption, the child may be claimed for the child tax credit and the dependency exemption on the non-custodial parent's return, and all of the remaining benefits will still stay with the custodial parent. But if you've got a situation like Jack and Sylvia, where Jack and Sylvia live together, you cannot say that either of them are non-custodial. And that means if Jack gives away any of the children, say Becky, to Sylvia, or vice versa, then all of the benefits associated with Becky go to Sylvia. And if Sylvia decides to give Becky to Jack, all of the benefits associated with Becky move to Jack. So true or false, you must be able to claim your child as a dependent to qualify for earned income credit on that child. Okay, <laughs> the answer is false. Most of you got the correct answer. It is not necessary to have a qualifying child for purposes of dependency in order to qualify for the earned income credit. And this is one of the important differences between dependency and the earned income credit. Let's go back, because now that we're back from break, and revisit the rules for the earned income credit. Let's see if any of the rules say that you have to be able to claim that child as a dependent. And obviously you're getting the hint that none of the rules say that. To qualify for the credit, you must meet all of the following rules. You must have a valid Social Security number. If your Social Security card says not valid for employment and you issued the card just so that you could get a benefit, such as Medicare, you don't qualify. Your filing status cannot be married filing separately. You must be a U.S. citizen or a resident alien all year. You must have lived in the United States for more than half the year if you do not have a qualifying child. If you do have a qualifying child, the child must have lived with you in the United States for more than half the year. You cannot file Form 2555. Your investment income must be $3,200 or less, and you must have earned income. Nowhere in there does it say that the child has to be your dependent, because they don't. So let's move on. Earned income credit in a nutshell. I like this table. It comes straight out of Pub 17, but you can also find it in other IRS publications. I think it's 596 that covers the earned income credit specifically. Uh, you can also find it on posters that the IRS issues or in the rules, maybe not just in this form, but certainly the IRS brings these rules at you over and over again. And I've always liked how this table is laid out. It's divided into three distinct sections. We have Part A. We have Part D, and they're really quite similar, Part A and D. And then in the middle section between those two, we have Part B and Part C. And Part B is rules that apply to people who have qualifying children. Part C is rules that apply only if you do not have a qualifying child. And then Part A and Part D apply to whether you have a qualifying child or not. And Part A and D, so you can see point one in Part A, and then point 15 in Part D both have to do with income. And the differences in income, if you want to read those with me, are for Part A, your adjusted gross income must be then less than the amount shown. And if you go over to Part D, your earned income must be less than the amount shown. So it's possible your adjusted gross income could be lower than your earned income, or your adjusted gross income could be higher than your earned income. It's mathematically possible, and the IRS is saying that both your AGI and your earned income must be less than the amount shown for your filing status and the number of qualifying children you have. Then rule number two says you must have a valid Social Security number, and your filing status cannot be married filing separate. You must be a U.S. citizen or a resident alien all year. You cannot file Form 2555. 
Your investment income must be less than 3200 and you must have earned income. So regardless of whether you have a qualifying child or not, all of the rules in Part A apply to everyone. If you do have a qualifying child, then we go over and look at the additional three rules that apply when there is a qualifying child. Your child must meet the relationship, age, residency, and joint return tests. None of those is a dependency test. Rule number nine, the qualifying child cannot be used by more than one person to claim the earned income credit. Rule number 10, you cannot be a qualifying child of another person. So if you qualify someone else for the earned income credit or for dependency, you yourself cannot have a qualifying child. Part C, rules if you do not have a qualifying child. You must be at least age 25 and under age 65. You cannot be the dependent of another person. You cannot be the qualifying child of another person. And you must have lived in the United States for more than half the year. So that's the nutshell rules, as the IRS calls them. Now, how do you go about claiming the earned income credit? You've pretty much figured out, ah, I've got someone, they qualify for earned income credit. How do I give it to them? Well, here's what you do. If you do not have a qualifying child, you simply figure the earned income credit using the earned income credit worksheet and tables, and then you enter the allowable earned income credit on Form 1040, Line 64A, or the equivalent lines on 1040A or 1040EZ. So even 1040EZ actually provides a line for the earned income credit, but it applies only when there are no qualifying children. If you do have qualifying children, then you need to attach Schedule EIC, and it forces you onto 1040A or the long form, and 1040EZ no longer can be used. Here is the Schedule EIC, and again, it only applies and is only used when you do have a qualifying child. And on the schedule, you enter for each child, in order here, the name of the child, the social security number for the child, the year that the child was born, you check the box that says, was the child under age 24 at the end of the year a student and younger than you, or your spouse is filing jointly? The answer is yes or no. Or B, was the child permanently and totally disabled? And then five, child's relationship to you. Example, son, daughter, grandchild, etc. They want you to put the relationship of the child in the space provided. And then on point number six, it says number of months that the child lived with you in the United States during 2012. And I made a point of drawing a red box around this point right here. It says if the child lived with you for more than half of 2012, but less than seven months, enter seven months. And then if the child was born or died in 2012 and your home was the child's home for more than half the year for the time that he or she was alive, enter 12. So if your child was born on December 30th and lived in your home for one day, that child is considered to have lived with you for the entire year. And on the form, you would therefore enter what amount? You would enter 12 for a child that was born during the year. Similarly, if a child died on January 10th, if that child lived with you for the period of time they were alive, you would also enter 12 as the number of months lived in the home. By contrast, let's suppose that you are, are sharing custody of your child. There's you and there's the other parent, and that child is spending some of the time with you, some of the time with the other parent, and you've established that that child was in your home more nights during the year than the other parent. So maybe you had the child for 190 nights, and the other parent had the child for the remaining number of nights in the year. You can establish that you had that child for at least six months, in fact, a few more days than six months, but you can't establish that the child was actually with you for seven months. Well, IRS says as long as you can show the child was with you for more than half the year, even if it wasn't a full seven months, you would still enter seven months on the months lived at home line. Now, something that does not appear anywhere in the IRS instructions uh, today, but used to be in the instructions many, many, many years ago when I first got in this business, or going way back into the 90s, it used to be the case that the instructions for earned income credit always had you list the youngest child first. And uh, if you pay attention to what your tax software does today, your tax software will still list the youngest child first. And that's not necessarily the order in which you enter children into the computer, is it? You typically enter children into the computer in the order you happen to list them on a sheet of paper or the order in which they appear on the Social Security cards that you're holding or even the order that they appear on the tax return from the prior year that you're copying the information into your computer from. 
So very often it is the case that as the children are entered into the computer, they are not entered in age order, and therefore when the children are listed on the front of the tax return as dependents, they're usually going to be listed on the front of the tax return in the order in which you entered them. And that can create a slight problem with the earned income credit because most tax software will list the children in the order that they appear on the EIC schedule. Well, why does that matter? Who cares? Well, it matters when it comes to doing question and answers for the earned income credit qualification checklist. Usually in your software, it's necessary for each qualifying child to go through the checklist and answer questions as they relate to each qualifying child. And that checklist, maybe there's three qualifying children and you're answering questions on the checklist for each qualifying child, but there happens to be a total of four children of which only three are qualifying. And the order of the tax return is that under dependents you've got child one, two, three, four, and child number four qualifies for earned income credit and children one and two qualify for EIC, but child number three doesn't. So you're answering in the checklist questions for the first three children, and the computer is only giving you EIC for two children <laughs> because you haven't answered questions relating to the, th the, the fourth child in the data entry. So it's just something that I have seen happen with my own staff. It's something I've observed when I'm preparing tax returns that I do have to pay attention that if I'm answering a questionnaire with respect to a child on the earned income credit form, that the questionnaires I fill out are in an order or in a priority that matches the order in which my software is entering them on the schedule EIC. And it, just as often as not, that's not the order I put them into the computer. All right, there are some additional special rules that apply for military clergy and people who have disability income or in some cases disabled dependents. And so if you're a member of the military, if you are a minister or member of the clergy, or if you are receiving disability benefits or you have a qualifying child who has a disability, there's some additional special rules that you should know about. Firstly, non-taxable military pay. Examples of non-taxable military pay are combat pay, basic allowance for housing, known as BAH, basic allowance for subsistence, which is BAS, and the amount of your non-taxable combat pay does show up on your W-2 in box 12 of the code Q. Combat pay is special because even though combat pay is not taxable to you and your spouse, each of you can choose to have your non-taxable combat pay included in your earned income for purposes of calculating the earned income credit. You should elect to include combat pay when calculating earned income credit if doing so increases the amount of earned income you are entitled to. Well, why would you want to do that? And to really do it, we need to go look at the tables. I'm going to just get to the back of the manual I have here. And, and we were having trouble loading the manual with all these earned income credit tables in them. So we hold them out, and you may not have this table in your manual as a result, but I'm going to still flip to some pages that would have it. So I'm here in the tables for the earned income credit, and let's see what happens. If the amount you are looking up from the worksheet, that is the earned income credit worksheet, shows that your income for qualifying for the earned income credit is at least a dollar, but less than $50, and you have no children, your earned income credit is $2. If you have one child, it's 9 If you have two children, it's 10 And if you have three children, it's 11 And it should be no surprise to you that as your income goes up, the amount of earned income credit you get goes up. Here we have $2,000 of income qualifies you for $689 of earned income credit if you have one child. It qualifies you for $810 if you have two children, and $911 if you have three children. And the percentages that the IRS uses here are supposed to be 35, 40, and 45 percent. So if I take $2,000, multiply that by 35 percent, I get $700. So it's not perfect math on the 2,000, but you can see that 2,000 multiplied by 35% equals 700, and it's pretty close to the 689. And if I take 2,000, multiply it by 40%, I get $800. Now I'm a little bit under the amount showing on the table instead of a little bit over. And if I take 2,000, multiply that by 45%, I get $900. So just as a general rule, if you're trying to figure out how much earned income credit your client is going to get, and the only source of income they have is a W-2, and their income is below a certain point, 
you just take the number on the W-2 and multiply it by the percentage rate that applies based on the number of children they have. And pretty much in your head, you're going to get within a pretty close range of how much earned income credit they're going to receive because there is a formula behind it. And you will see that as earned income goes up, the amount of credit keeps going up because we're always using that baseline of 35, 40, and 45%. And I like to refer to it, and I've probably seen it referred in writing elsewhere as well, to how earned income credit works as being something along the lines of a bell-shaped curve. So a bell-shaped curve works like this. So when you're calculating the earned income credit, where your income falls is going to dictate how much earned income credit you get. And as your income rises, you get more and more earned income credit. Finally, you reach a plateau. That's the maximum amount of earned income credit that it's possible to receive. And then from that point onward, every dollar extra you earn is pushing you farther and farther down the bell-shaped curve, sloping you away from the maximum earned income credit until you eventually get a point right here where you earn too much and you're not allowed any earned income credit at all. So if we're looking at the issue of combat pay and whether or not we should make an election to include combat pay in the income of our client for purposes of earned income credit only, it doesn't mean we're adding it to line 7 as wages and making them pay income tax on it. It just means we're adding it to the earned income credit worksheet so that they will receive credit for purposes of calculating their earned income for earned income credit purposes. In other words, if putting it in their income for the earned income credit calculation makes their income go up, on this side of the bell, then we would want to add combat pay to their income because maybe their income is really only about here, about the $17,000 point without adding in combat pay. But if you kick their income up to here with combat pay, maybe they're going to get more earned income credit. On the other hand, maybe without combat pay, their regular income in the military is putting them right here on the bell-shaped curve. And if you add combat pay into their earned income credit calculation, it's actually going to push them farther down the table. So you really have to look at where they fall on the curve. And if they fall on a curve where adding combat pay to their income helps them, you can do that. And if you're at a point on the curve where adding combat pay takes away EIC, then you don't have to. Now if you have a client that is kind of right about here, and if you added their combat pay to their income, you could push them up here. But the problem is adding combat pay to their income actually pushes them down here because adding all of their combat pay puts them right about where they started or maybe even a little bit worse off where they started. The question is, can I just add some of their combat pay and not all of their combat pay? And as you might figure, the answer to that is no. IRS says, that if you make the election to include combat pay in income for purposes of calculating earned income credit, you have to include all of the combat pay for that particular person. But if you have a married couple and both the husband and the wife are receiving combat pay, you could include the combat pay of one spouse and not include the combat pay of the other spouse. Or you could include both combat pay or no combat pay. Either of those options is acceptable. So let's move over to the tables again and just see where we max out. It's an interesting exploration that I like to do. I always like to see where the max is. It's a number I like to keep in my head. And I know it's somewhere in the 20s that people max out on earned income credit for, for most filers. But if you don't have a qualifying children, obviously it's going to be much lower than the 20s. So let's just look at the columns here for EIC. We have no children. We have one child. We have two children. We have three children. And on this page, we can see with no children, the maximum EIC is $193. As we scroll down, we can see EIC reaches $419 when the income is $5,400. We move over to the next page, and just looking at that no children column, we can see a point where we hit $475, and then it's flat. And it stays at $475 until we get to $7,800 of income. So that means that for a person without a qualifying child, that you're going to max out on the and receive the maximum amount of earned income credit possible for your income level when your income is between these numbers right here, essentially $6,000 and $7,500 of income. And if your income is less than $6,000, you get less earned income credit. And if your income is more than $7,500, you start to get less earned income credit. Now, if you do have a qualifying child, it takes quite a bit longer before you max out. Just keep going, and you can see that I've hit a point where the number is flat. 
$3,169, that's the maximum amount of earned income credit that a person can receive with one child. And we go over and see what income level that happens at, and it happens at $9,300 of income. And how long is it till we start to go down? We're at $3,169 for another page, another page, right about the bottom of this page right here. So right when the income hits 16950 so this is a $7,000 income range between 9000 and 17000 It's really an $8,000 income range where the in earned income credit is flat. So whether your client has 9000 of income or 17000 of income, if they have one qualifying child, their earned income credit is not going to change. So if you have a client who has combat pay of $5,000 and their earned income on the W-2 is showing 5000 you would want to add the combat pay in there because it would push them up into the maximum earned income credit. But on the other hand, if their W-2 is showing that their earned income is $10,000 and their combat pay is $5,000 and you throw the combat pay in but nothing changes, it would be because they're at a point where there is no change. They, they fall within that level where you can have income fluctuate by several thousand dollars and the EIC doesn't change. And then, of course, it could be the case you throw combat pay in and it throws their income over 17000 in which case they've tipped the scale and now the EIC is going down. Well, let's compare that for a family that has two children. Is there a point where we max out on two children? And the answer is yes. It happens to be the same level of income as when there's only one child. So I gave you that thing where I think of EIC maxing out when the income's at 20, and actually that's not the case. It's when it's in the teens. However, when you are filing jointly, the income can be a little bit higher before you start to do the phase out. So the income for the joint tables allows for a higher level of income before you start to go down. So if you see here at $17,250 of income, without being married, in other words, having a filing status as single or head of household, the EIC is already going down. But for a married couple, the EIC is not going down. And so for a married couple, their level of income can be approximately $5,000 more than for the other filing statuses before they start to lose EIC. So we can see 17000 if we added 5000 it's going to take us into the 20s. Before, you can see here, for a married couple, we're well into the 20s, and the earned income credit doesn't start to drop for a married couple until the income hits 22000 So yeah, I kind of walk around in my head with my bell-shaped curve, and it says somewhere in the 5000 for a person without a qualifying child, it's somewhere around fifteen to 17000 for a person who is not married but does have a qualifying child, and for a married couple with qualifying children, it's around 20000 that they're going to max out on earned income credit. So those are just numbers you can carry around in your head, and it can be useful to know that. Moving back into the manual, what page was I on? Non-taxable military pay. I think I've pretty much explained to you the rules for combat pay, but I just wanted to remind you again of this specific detail. Either you or your spouse or both of you can separately make the election to include combat pay in income for purposes of calculating the earned income credit, but you can't include only part of your individual combat pay. It's either all or nothing for each of you respectively. Um, military personnel stationed outside of the United States, members of the military on extended active duty outside of the United States are considered to be inside the United States for purposes of EIC. Members of the clergy, if you are a minister or a member of a religious order, you may have net earnings from self-employment and also minister's housing allowance. The rental value of a home or housing allowance provided to a minister as a part of that minister's pay is generally not subject to income tax but is included in net earnings from self-employment. For that reason, the housing allowance is included in earned income for purposes of calculating the earned income credit, even if it's not included in taxable income on the wage line. The only exception to that rule is if the minister has an approved form 4361 or 4029 on file with the IRS, and that simply means that that particular minister has made a religious objection to the Social Security system and they're opting out of it. And I've never had a minister who actually did that because once they find out that opting out of the Social Security system means that they don't get Social Security when they retire, they kind of think maybe they'll pay that tax anyway. So most of my ministers do not opt out. Disability in the earned income credit. 
Some disability retirement benefits qualify as earned income to claim the earned income tax credit. And also, you can claim a relative of any age who is totally and permanently disabled and fits all other eligibility requirements. So let's just suppose you're a working couple, your income is $30,000, and you have a 30-year-old son living with you in your home, and he has autism, he's basically got a disability. It's a diagnosed disability, it's a permanent disability, and it would meet the requirements for being considered disabled for purposes of the earned income credit. So even though your child is not a full-time student under age 24 and is not under age 19, the fact that he's disabled means he could still qualify you for the earned income credit. And on terms of disability income, what does the IRS mean by that? Some form of disability could qualify you for EIC. Well, essentially, when you have a job working for an employer, many employers purchase disability insurance for their workers. And if something happens that causes you to become disabled, very often you will continue to receive payment, but not from your employer, usually through their insurance plan. And when that insurance plan makes payments to you, because you're disabled, those payments are usually issued on a W-2 up until the point you reach the minimum retirement age. And when they're issued on a W-2, they can qualify you for the earned income credit. I haven't seen that very often, but I have seen it where a person did get a W-2, it was for disability, and it did entitle them to the earned income credit. Now, how often does it happen that a person applies for earned income credit and then the IRS challenges it, says they don't qualify for it? Quite often, actually, especially when two or more people file tax returns claiming the same child, the IRS is automatically going to send letters to both parties that claimed that child. And sometimes you could have a client who receives a letter from the IRS they claimed their child validly. They're actually entitled to claim their child, but they didn't respond to the IRS letter as they're supposed to. Uh, how often do we have clients who get letters from the IRS and put their head in the sand and ignore them? All the time, in my experience. Uh, people get a letter from the IRS, they open it, they can't understand it. The logical thing from my perspective, from a customer service perspective, is that I would expect them to call me and say, hey, I've got a letter, can you help me with it? But only a small percentage of clients who get these letters actually act on them. Many of them throw them in the garbage. Many of them panic when they get them and try and hide them. They hope that the problem will go away. <laughs> and when they do that, the IRS automatically will rule against them. And so what I've had happen, amazing as it may seem, I've actually had a client who claimed the earned income credit on her tax return. I prepared a tax return and we claimed the earned income credit. She got an audit letter from the IRS and she didn't call me. And then she didn't respond to the IRS either. And she didn't show up for the audit at any time. And finally, because she ignored their audit letters, the IRS completely disallowed the earned income credit. And when they disallowed the earned income credit, they sent her a letter that was a bill asking for a full refund of all of the earned income credit they had paid her. And she sat on that. <laughs> And finally, it was tax season, and she came in to see me, and she had a big scowl on her face. She was all mad at me because I'd done her tax return wrong. And she assumed that because she got a letter from the IRS that I'd done her tax return wrong. And, of course, that's not the case at all. The IRS randomly chooses people for audit, and sometimes it specifically targets income groups or even the, the clients of a particular tax preparer for audit. But it doesn't mean that the tax return was done wrong. So at any rate, by the time this woman came to see me, it was essentially too late to deal with that particular audit. The audit had been closed. The only thing we could do at that point was to ask for an audit reconsideration request. That's where we basically say, yeah, the audit's closed, we know it, but we want you to reopen it and reconsider our case. And when we did that, we were able to provide enough documentation that the IRS did allow the earned income credit. But the unfortunate part about it was how much effort it took simply because the client ignored the opportunity to respond. So with that, let's return to this Form 8862, Claim for EIC After Denial. Well, the IRS can deny EIC because a person failed to respond to an IRS letter, as in the case of my client, until we got her cleared up, or they could receive a denial of the earned income credit from the IRS because the IRS deems that they claimed it inappropriately. Perhaps they claimed earned income credit for a person that's not their qualifying child. That happens all the time, right? <laughs> uh, claiming a child that you're not allowed to claim. And when that happens, 
in a future year, if you wish to qualify for earned income credit again, because you believe you do qualify, the IRS will require you to attach Form 8862 for the first year that you wish to reapply and claim an earned income credit. So if you qualify to claim EIC by meeting all of the rules described in IRS Publications or 596, for any year after 1996, and you were denied or your earned income credit was reduced for any reason other than for a math or clerical error, you must attach a completed Form 8862 to your next tax return in order to claim the earned income credit. But IRS says, however, do not file Form 8862 if either one or two below is true. Number one being, after your earned income credit was reduced or disallowed in the earlier year, you filed Form 8862 in a later year and your EIC for that later year was allowed, and your EIC has not been reduced or disallowed again for any reason other than a math or clerical error. Or two, you are taking the earned income credit without a qualifying child for 2012, and the only reason your EIC was reduced or disallowed in the earlier year was because the IRS determined that a child listed on the Schedule EIC was not your qualifying child. So let's just suppose in the earlier year you claimed a child that you're not allowed to claim. The IRS disallowed that child. This year your income is low enough that you're qualifying for the earned income credit without a qualifying child. IRS says please don't attach 8862 because you're not trying to claim a qualifying child. You're just trying to claim yourself and we've never disallowed that before. Also, do not file Form 8862 or take earned income credit for two years after there was a final determination that your earned income credit claim was due to reckless or intentional disregard of the EIC rules, or 10 years after there was a final determination that your EIC claim was due to fraud. There is an exception to this rule for math or clerical errors, and I mentioned it a minute ago. If your EIC was denied or reduced as a result of a math or clerical error, do not attach Form 8862 to your tax return. For example, if your arithmetic is incorrect, the IRS can correct it. And you know I was just looking at the EIC tables there in the manual. If my I went to the wrong line, I might pull the wrong earned income credit amount off the line and put it on the 1040 and claim it. Well, when the IRS is processing the tax return, they're going to notice that I have the wrong number for earned income credit, and they might correct it. Maybe I've claimed $100 too much because my I moved to the wrong line. They're going to just do a mathematical correction, and that is not a denial of the earned income credit. That is just a clerical or a mathematical error, and uh, so don't attach 8862 because of that kind of a change. Omission of Form 8862. If you are required to attach 8862 to your return to claim the EIC and you don't do so, the earned income credit claim will automatically be denied unless it was a math or clerical error in the earlier year. Now, one of the things about 8862 is that the software in advance will not tell you that it's required. But when you file a tax return for a client who's required to attach 8862 and you file it electronically, the IRS will reject the return. So in other words, if you file a tax return electronically and that tax return has an EIC claim on it, and the IRS sees that there's an EIC claim, but their records also show that 8862 should be attached and it is not, they actually reject that tax return from e-file. And that's a good thing because if it's been rejected, it means that we'll get an error code in telling us, hey, 8862 is required. And at that point, the tax return is no longer filed. It is not filed. It's not accepted. And we have time to go to the client and say, hey, 8862 is required. Let's put down the required information and resubmit it electronically. And if we submit it electronically with the required information, then the IRS will accept it. Now, of course, when you do submit a tax return, either paper or electronically with Form 8862 attached, your client should be expecting a very long wait. You know, the normal turnaround for a tax return with the modernized e-file can be as little as 10 days. Client files on the 10th of the month. Within 10 days, they're probably going to have the refund. But in terms of earned income credit, very often it takes longer than that because the IRS gives closer scrutiny to the earned income credit. It might be closer to three weeks for some filers claiming earned income credit. But if your client has an 8862 attached, you could be talking months. So if you've got a client that's come to you and their tax return has been filed, the IRS rejects it because 8862 is required, so then you attach it and you e-file it again, you may as well at that point in time tell your client it's going to be a long wait. <laughs> and in fact, the IRS 
is more than likely going to have to do follow-up letters in the mail asking for documentation or verification. 8862 doesn't mean they won't get their money, but it does mean that if they do get their money, it's probably going to take much, much longer than is normally the case. So you may have to provide the IRS with additional documents or information before a refund claim relating to EIC is released to you, even if you do attach the form as required. And you can see on the form in Part 1, you answer questions. What is the year for which you're making this claim? If it was 2012, you'd enter the year. And line number two, if the only reason your EIC was reduced or disallowed in the earlier year was because you incorrectly reported your earned income or investment income, check yes, otherwise check no. And then it says, if you checked yes, stop. Do not fill in the rest of this form. But you must attach it to your tax return to take EIC if you checked no. And if you did check no, continue. And then it says, could you or your spouse of filing jointly be claimed as a qualifying child of another person for the year? Because if you can, you're out. You don't get the earned income credit. And then it says, for filers who have a qualifying child or children, go through and provide the information, the number of days that each child lived with you. Then it asks, what was the child's date of birth? And where did the child live? And any other person who is living with the child other than you that might be qualifying to claim that child, they want to know who's in the household to uh, make sure that you're providing true and full disclosure on that child. Okay, welcome back from break everyone. You can see that during the break I posted up some more questions relating to Jack and Sylvia just to see if you were on your toes. And let's look at problems six and seven first. It says, right, which of the children below qualify as Jack's qualifying relative? And over on number seven it says, which of the children are qualifying relatives for Sylvia? Well, one of the rules we have for qualifying relative is that a person you want to claim as a qualifying relative, the very first test under the qualifying relative column is that if the person you want to claim as a qualifying relative is the qualifying child of someone else, then they cannot be your qualifying relative. And with respect to Sylvia and Jack, that's very, very important because Sylvia is the mother of Ben. It means that Ben is her qualifying child. And therefore, he could not be the qualifying relative of Jack. He's automatically out. There's no possibility for Jack to claim Ben at all because Ben is Sylvia's qualifying child. And by that same token, George and Samantha are qualifying children of Jack. And therefore, it's impossible for Sylvia to claim either of them as qualifying relatives because she fails that very first test in that those children are qualifying children of someone else. So if you look at who is not the qualifying child of someone, the only relative available that is not a qualifying child is Jonathan. So for both Sylvia and Jack, Jonathan is the only person living in the household who meets the test for being a qualifying relative. Let's look at the next problem. Referring to, again, the Jack and Sylvia problem, I've asked you to figure the amount of earned income credit, the maximum amount of earned income credit each of them could qualify for. Well, you can qualify for earned income credit if you have a qualifying child who meets all of the tests for EIC. And for Jack and Sylvia, each of them have some children that they jointly can claim or a child that they can jointly claim, and then each of them has a child or children that only they can claim. In the case of Jack, the only children available to him for earned income credit, well, there's three of them. There is the child, Becky, who is a child of both Jack and Sylvia. So Becky is a qualifying child to Jack. George is a qualifying child to Jack, and so is Samantha. So Jack can qualify for earned income credit on up to three children. On Sylvia's side of the equation, there are two children who meet the qualifying child tests for her. Becky, who is also Jack's qualifying child, and Ben, who can be only her qualifying child. Now, so we have a situation where Jack could claim three children, one of whom is Becky, 
And Sylvia could claim two children, one of whom is Becky. Now, clearly only one of them can ultimately claim Becky, but we're interested in what is the most earned income credit Jack could receive if he claimed every child he could claim. And the answer is he could qualify for a maximum earned income credit of $4,009 based on his income of 26000 and three qualifying children. And Becky, the most number of children she can qualify for is two, and if she were to claim the two children she qualifies for, both Becky and Ben, her EIC would fall on choice number B, which is $3,144. So later at the end of the class, we'll actually throw up the answer keys for Jack and Sylvia, and we'll show you how we ultimately have chosen to allocate those dependencies and the child tax credit and the earned income credit so that their household gets the maximum refund possible legally. Much as I love the earned income credit and I, I see its social place in our country to help lower income families who need that financial cushion to help them survive in a very expensive world, there is a lot of burden that's being placed on the tax preparer to ensure that we award only earned income credit where it should be awarded and not just haphazardly. And depending on where you work and what your own knowledge standards are and what the standards are of the office that you work in and even the neighborhood that your office is located in, you're going to see different kinds of stuff. Now, I've been in this business for more than 20 years, and when I first got into this business, I owned a tax franchise, one of the big national ones. And I bought into that franchise in an existing office, and I had a location that it was kind of a, an eclectic neighborhood. We had all different mixes of people. We had lots of middle class people, but we also were close enough to some lower income neighborhoods that we were drawing those people in. And that particular franchise back in those days specifically targeted the low income neighborhoods. In fact, when I bought my franchise, they sat down with us and educated us about where to open. If we wanted our franchise to be successful, we should purchase an office that was in the middle of some of the lowest income zip codes per capita in the city. That was where you're going to make the most money, they said. So you know, we took out a map of the city and we were looking at zip codes and what the income was in each zip code. And where we ultimately had our office was not in one of the lower income neighborhoods, but it was pretty close to one. So we were drawing them in and we were seeing lots of lower income people coming to our, to our offices. And in those early days, the number of clients we had that were claiming earned income credit was very, very high. We were seeing thousands of people a year who could qualify for earned income credit coming into our offices. And back in those days, the IRS really hadn't nailed down in the earliest days 20 years ago the, the systems that they have in place today for finding fraud. But it doesn't mean that it wasn't going on because it was going on a lot. And I was certainly aware of some of it that was happening. And I feel like I'm a fairly ethical person. I want to do what's right. And I don't want to give the EIC where it's not allowed, but I do want to give it where it is allowed. And because we were seeing such a large number of earned income credit filers, we were targeted by fraud scams. Our firm was repeatedly over time. And it didn't take much to notice when it was happening. And even today, 20 years later, when our entire market is very much changed, and today only the tiniest fraction of our clients qualify for earned income credit. Most of our clients are moderate to high income clients today. We still do have clients coming in who do get the earned income credit. And even today, we can still see some of the fraudulent activity going on, even though it's at lower levels because our volume is lower. But I'll give you an example of the type of thing that I see going on over time. I've seen people create fake W-2s to show income that they didn't have to try and get the earned income credit. And I've also seen them push fake withholding into the box two for withholding. And how would I know it was a fake W-2? Well, if it smells funny, looks funny, talks funny, walks funny, it probably is funny. And in the case of this W-2 that I'm thinking of, it definitely was fraudulent. And how I figured that out, I called the employer that was listed on it and they didn't exist. So that was a client that I just turned over to the IRS quietly in the background without letting them know I'd done it. 
But we were also targeted by a group of people who were preparing hand-done tax returns. It was Schedule C E Z over and over again. All of the clients had the same last name, or they were claiming dependents that had similar names for the earned income credit. And they'd all show a gross amount of receipts on the schedule. They'd show a certain amount of expense on the schedule. They'd show a net profit on the schedule. And you knew that that net profit was placing them somewhere at the top of the bell-shaped curve, where they were getting the biggest refund they could from the earned income credit based on that self-employment. Well, the first one that comes through, you kind of go, oh, that's interesting. The second one that comes through, you're going, okay, my, now my alarm bells are going. And then we started to notice faces and people escorting people in and out of our offices. And that's where we turned it over to the IRS fraud department, and they took over from there and shut that ring down. But that's just one that I've seen over time, and I've seen many over time. So odds are if you're working in a tax office that has a high volume of earned income credit claims, there's going to be a fraud scam come in through your office most tax seasons. And the question is, are you on top of it or not? Because you need to be. And if you're not, you're probably going to get bitten as a tax preparer because the IRS has due diligence requirements in place for those of you who are preparing tax returns that claim the earned income credit. And it's your responsibility to exercise due diligence in multiple ways. So firstly, let's, well, or with that speech, let's get on to the due diligence requirements. And I put a lot of focus on due diligence because the IRS puts a lot of focus on due diligence. I figure when people come to me for training and when I'm looking at my own staff, due diligence is a top priority of the IRS. Therefore, it's my top priority as both a supervisor, a tax business owner, and as an instructor. So we're going to spend quite a bit of time talking about due diligence here for the last part of today's class. So if you are a paid preparer, you must adhere to due diligence requirements as outlined by the IRS. And the IRS says you have exercised due diligence if you maintain a written record of your client interview, which shows you asked questions necessary for determining your client's entitlement to the earned income credit. There are due diligence procedures, and under the regulations, a tax preparer must not know or have a reason to know that any of the information used in determining earned income credit eligibility or the amount of the earned income credit is incorrect. Paid preparers must also complete Form 8867 Paid Preparers Earned Income Credit Checklist, and they must also ask more questions if the information furnished by the taxpayer appears to be incorrect, inconsistent, or incomplete, and they cannot ignore implications of information that is furnished or known. So in other words, let's just suppose you've got a married couple that have come to you for years, and they have four children between them. And one year, one of them comes in and says that they're no longer living together, that they're separated, and that they both individually meet the head of household filing requirements. And yet, when you're preparing your tax returns or preparing their tax returns, you happen to notice that they both still have the same address on the front of the tax return. Well, that's something that could not be ignored. Your clients are telling you that they're separated and don't live together, and yet on the tax return, they're filing with the same address. So that should have your alarm bells ringing. It doesn't mean that they do live together, that the address is the same, but it should cause you a great deal of concern so that you're asking the questions necessary to determine whether or not they did in fact live apart for the last half of the year or whether they were in fact together. And that's one that clients pull all the time. Married couples all the time come in and tell their tax preparers that they're single or separated to try and maximize earned income credit. It doesn't take a lot of intelligence to come up with that idea. <laughs> All right, so IRS due diligence procedures. The IRS has created this list, and it seems to grow over time. Yesterday, I went and at, inserted into the manual the latest version that I could find on IRS's site of due diligence procedures, and it has a lot more bullet points than it did just a couple of years ago. And they divide it into four distinct categories, which they call complete and submit the eligibility checklist, then a category for computing the credit, then they have a knowledge category, and then they have a record keeping category. So we'll take each of these in turn. Firstly, you have to complete Form 8867. Go through all of the list of criteria on there and interview your client and ask them every question and then check off their response. You must complete the checklist that is based on information provided to you by your client, and you shouldn't be making up the answers and answering them in a way that's convenient so that the credit is awarded. The client needs to respond truthfully to you, or at least you need to have that client tell you their responses to the questions on the checklist. For returns or claims for refund filed electronically, the 8867 needs to go electronically, and if it's a paper return, it needs to get submitted with the paper return. Next, we have computing the credit. You must complete the EITC worksheet that is shown in the 1040 instructions to show how you calculated the credit. 
The IRS does not want you to mail the worksheet in, but they do want it maintained in the tax preparer records to show how the tax preparer calculated the earned income credit amount. And that worksheet would be used to factor in things like combat pay and minister's housing allowance, self-employment, wage income, to basically show where you arrived at your income amount that was used to go to the tables and calculate the credit. The big one for me is the knowledge requirement. The IRS is saying that you, the tax preparer, have to know what the law is. You can't just say, well, I think that seems good enough, so I'll give it to you. That's not an acceptable level of due diligence. Due diligence is to know what the law is. And that means based on everything that you've learned from me and throughout your experience as a tax preparer, you should understand what the requirements for earned income credit are. The law requires that you do that. You must also take into account what your client says and what you know about your client. If your client says that they're separated from their spouse, but you have firsthand knowledge that they're not separated from their spouse, you can't ignore that fact. You must not know or have reason to know that any information used to determine your client's eligibility for or the amount of the earned income credit is incorrect, inconsistent, or incomplete. And what the IRS is getting at with that, you know, there's many different ways that that could be the case, but one of the big ways that that's the case is with calculating profit and loss for a small business owner. Now, according to the bell-shaped curve, a person who's self-employed may find that it benefits them to not claim certain expenses of their business because it will give them a higher profit. And IRS says that when you are self-employed, you have to arrive at the true profit of your business and base the earned income credit on your true profit and not some inflated profit that serves to give you more EIC. Similarly, a client might choose to not report all of the gross receipts for their business because it keeps their income lower, makes their earned income credit higher, and also saves them self-employment tax. That's actually fraudulent as well and not allowed, and you should not know or have any reason to know that your client is trying to pull that off. Now, just yesterday, one of the accountants in our firm was specifically asked by a client to take off some expenses because they wanted to make their income higher, probably for a bank loan or something else along those lines. And any time a client asks you to take expenses off, that should get your alarm bells going <laughs> as much as anything because there is a true profit and the IRS wants to see that true profit reflected, not whatever is convenient to the client, like tricking a bank into thinking like they earned more or tricking the IRS into give them more earned income credit. It needs to be a true reflection of their income. So a client asking you to take expenses off the return, that should have your alarm bells going. Now, if it, they legitimately have determined that they're not entitled to an expense, that they thought they had paid, but they find out they didn't pay it, well, of course you take it off but not the other option. Now you do need to document any additional questions that you have asked your client and how your client responded to those answers. There's two different ways that I do that. When I'm in an interview with a client, and it's the early part of tax season, so the earned income credit cl clients that I have, they're all in usually in that first two weeks of the season from about the 20th of January till about the 10th of February. That's when I see my earned income credit clients. So they're coming in, they're sitting down in front of me, and I'm enjoying that time of the season. They're happy, they're getting their refunds, but I'm also staying on top of things. And some of the questions that I ask my clients are things like, okay, how many people are living with you in your household at this point? Because very often they'll pull out and they'll say, well, I'm claiming Jessica and I'm claiming Monica this year, but Matthew, he's gone. He doesn't live with me anymore. Or I'm not claiming him because his father's claiming him. I'll get sentences like that or statements like that coming from my client. And I go, okay, all right. All right, so explain to me who is living in your household in 2012. Not now, because now is not what we're preparing a tax return for. It's 2013. I care about what was the case in 2012. So tell me who was living in your house in 2012. You said not to claim Matthew because his father's claiming him. Well, where did Matthew live in 2012? And for that matter, where did Matthew's father live? Well, if it turns out that Matthew and his father both lived with my client all of the year, now I need to establish whether or not my client and the father of Matthew are married. If they're not married and she chooses to let the father of Matthew claim him, that's a perfectly legitimate thing, just as like we have with Jack and Sylvia. Jack and Sylvia live together. There's that common child of Becky. Sylvia can give Becky to Jack or vice versa. That's perfectly legitimate. But let's just suppose that my client has decided not to claim her son Matthew because she wants her boyfriend to claim Matthew instead. Do I have to force her to claim Matthew? 
Well, the answer is I don't have to force her to claim Matthew, but I certainly would make a written record of the fact that my client told me to leave the son Matthew off her return because she was going to give Matthew to someone else. Now, the fact that she's decided she's going to give Matthew to a man who is not Matthew's father, does that mean that because my client has given permission for that man to claim Matthew that he can claim Matthew? So, for example, in the Jack and Sylvia situation, if Sylvia decided not to claim Ben, does that mean that Jack could? And the answer is no, because Ben is the qualifying child of Sylvia. He cannot be the qualifying relative of Jack. And if Ben cannot pass the qualifying relative test for Jack, Jack is not allowed to claim him. And so in the case of my client who wants to give her son Matthew to an unrelated person as a dependent, but Matthew lived with her all year and is her qualifying child, I'm going to tell her, well, you know, I don't have to put Matthew on your return. You don't have to claim him. But this other person is not allowed to claim him just because you decided you want to give him to him. So I take notes like that. I have conversations like that all the time. And on the flip side of things, if I have a client come in and they hand me Social Security cards for all of the dependents they're going to claim that year, one of the things I do is I look through those Social Security cards and establish what the relationships of the individuals listed on those cards are. If my client's last name is Smith and one of the Social Security cards for one of their dependents says the last name is Jones, the first thing that comes to my mind is, okay, why does this child have a different last name than you do? Now, if it's a woman, it's not uncommon for the child to have a different last name, but every child has a father, right? <laughs> so I'm going to be asking, where's the father? Where's the Jones father? Your name's Smith, your child's name is Jones, where's the father? Those are questions that I ask routinely, and I make written notes as they go. And in fact, I even put those written notes into note screens in my computer so that they carry forward year to year, and I'm not running around reading in drawers looking for written records that might have been even shredded because they got to be old enough. Our computer files stay accessible for longer. All right, the Treasury regulations. Do you give examples of when to apply the knowledge requirement? And if you click on the link in your manual, it will take you to a PDF copy of some illustrations and examples IRS has of the types of documentation you should keep and the types of questions you should be asking. And finally, the record keeping, I've already described to you the types of notes that I take, but in addition to that, you should keep a copy of the 8867 in your EITC worksheet. You should keep copies of any documents that your client gives you that you use to determine their eligibility for the earned income credit. So there's no law typically out there that we think of historically that says we have to make a photocopy of our client's Social Security cards and keep them, except for the fact that the IRS now has this rule that says if your client presented to you a copy of a birth certificate or a copy of a Social Security card or some other documentation to show you why they meet the relationship test or all of the other tests required to claim this particular child for the earned income credit, IRS says you are required to make a photocopy of that and keep it in your records. You need to verify the identity of the person who is giving information for the tax return to you. You may have a person other than the person for whom you're preparing the return bring that information to you, and you need to verify the identity of whoever it is that's bringing you that information. And personally, when I'm preparing a tax return based on information provided to me by a name other than the name on the tax return, at some point I like to reach out and speak, at least over the telephone or via email, to the actual person I'm preparing that tax return for. I like to have that direct communication at some point. And the only exception to that rule really is when I'm preparing a tax return for a dependent. Also, you must keep these records that you've got for three years from the latest date that the following applies. The original due date of the tax return, not including any extension of time for filing, or if you electronically file the return, the date the return or claim for refund is filed, or if the return or claim for refund is not e-filed and you sign it as the return preparer, the date that you present the tax return or claim for refund to your client for signature, or if you prepare part of the return or claim for refund and another preparer completes it and then signs that return, you must keep the part of the return you were responsible for completing for three years from the date you submit it to the signing tax preparer. You must keep your records in either paper or electronic format, but you make sure you have them available if the IRS asks for them. And the EIC eligibility checklist is coming up next. You can see we have the EITC checklist, and this is a color copy. It's actually available from the IRS. You can order it online, and they'll send it to you in a big poster size that you can hang on your wall. 
I like to keep things like this with me on my desk and turn them around and read them to my clients as we go. So if I have an issue with something that they want to do, or maybe they have an issue with something that I want to do <laughs> or not do, that I can show them this checklist and walk them through it. The next item is a poster that Iris had on its website a couple of years ago. I looked for it high and low yesterday and couldn't find it, but I really like it. <laughs> maybe if you can find it, you can let me know what the link for it is. But this poster really breaks down the four requirements for claiming a child for the earned income credit very nicely. It says there's the relationship test that the child has to pass, the residency test, the age test, and the joint return test. And then it also spells out the tiebreaker rules. And under the tiebreaker rules, who will finally be awarded the exemption or the dependency or the earned income credit for a particular child. So best practices with respect to EITC due diligence, Iris says you need to get all of the right facts. And how do you get the right facts? You get them by asking all of the right questions. You need to document as you go and keep a written record of all of the questions that you ask and how your client responded to those questions. You should never rely on your tax software alone to get it right, because if you do, you're going to get it wrong. Keep up on training and education, scrutinize questionable returns, turn away dishonest filers, and review the return for quality. This means that managers should review the work of their tax preparers. Now in Oregon, it's the law, but in no other state is it the case that a preparer working underneath the supervision of someone else is required to have their work reviewed. It is only the case here in Oregon, and it's only the case of a person who is a tax preparer, not a tax consultant. So if you are a preparer and you have not achieved that LTC status here in Oregon, the law in Oregon requires that your work be reviewed. But whether the person working in a company is a tax preparer, an enrolled agent, a CPA, or an LTC, you should have your work reviewed anyway. Because as long as I've been doing this, I'm far from perfect, and by having my work reviewed, several major errors a year are discovered and prevented from getting out <laughs> on the tax return. And EIC in particular is important because if you have a tax preparer who is engaging in a pattern of negligent or fraudulent activity, that can come down on your firm if the IRS decides to do an investigation of the clients of that preparer or, God forbid, all of the rest of your clients in your firm that you're preparing EIC for, it could really be a financial catastrophe for your business to get selected because you have one or more unscrupulous tax preparers engaging in improper behavior. So for that reason alone, it's a good idea to be reviewing their work. The do's and don'ts of due diligence. <laughs> Here's some of the things that I think you should do and should not do. You should not ask the question, are you head of household? And very often I have clients come in to me and say, and this year I'm filing head of household. Well, that's very nice of you to tell me you're filing as head of household, but let me as your tax preparer establish that you pass all tests necessary to be able to use that filing status. So asking my client whether or not they qualify for head of household, that to me is negligent. It's my job to establish whether or not they do. So how would I determine that they qualify for head of household status? Well, I would ask questions like, were you married on the last day of the year? And if you were married, did you live with your spouse at any time in the last half of the year? Whether you're married or not, did you pay more than half the cost of keeping up the home for the year? And so on. Don't ask, how many dependents do you have? That's my job to determine how many dependents my client has by interviewing and asking the right questions and actually going through and maybe determining and agreeing with my client which dependents they're entitled to claim and ultimately which dependents they should claim or could they give away legally. So types of questions you can ask to determine who in the household might qualify them as dependents or earned income credit. You could ask a question like, please tell me about your family situation. Who's living with you in your house? How many people are there? And how are they related to you? And how old are they? And are they working? What kind of income do they have? Another way to do it is, do you live alone or are there other people with you in your house? Who are those other people? Do you own the home that you live in or do you rent it? Who pays the rent? If there is rent, who signed the rental agreement and whose names are on the rental agreement? Who else lives with you in your home? And so on. So these are the types of questions I ask. And in no time am I ever asking my client to tell me what their filing status is and who their dependents are. That's my job. 
Over and under reporting of income is a major error that the IRS frequently encounters, and it can be a cause for concern for any tax practitioner if their client is audited on their Schedule C net income or loss, and it's badly done. It's embarrassing at worst, and it can cause you to get fines as well. To avoid errors and comply with due diligence requirements, tax preparers need to be on the lookout for questionable W-2s and business income that works either to qualify a client for the maximum earned income credit or to qualify a taxpayer for the maximum earned income credit. In an effort to bring income down to qualify or maximize earned income credit, a tax preparer could be tempted to overstate the amount of Schedule C income, overstate losses to a business, or over or underestimate business expenses, and you're not allowed to do any of those things. Clients who want to claim the earned income credit based on self-employment income must have adequate documentation to show that they are actually operating a business. The records should show how they calculated their income, and they should have receipts, canceled checks, and or debit or credit card statements that document the expenses that they paid. Adequate documentation on the part of a tax preparer or a taxpayer is required under the law. So in other words, the law requires a taxpayer to have records. And we often think, oh, well, you have to be able to prove you had an expense. But when it comes to the earned income credit, the IRS is going to ask you to prove you had the income as well as that the expenses are somewhat close to what you're claiming on the return. Well, you know, a lot of people who qualify for earned income credit, they're not necessarily the best record keepers. You may have noticed that. I certainly have. What's a common thing I might see? Child daycare in the home. My client does child daycare in their home. How much money did they have? Well, their clients pay them cash every week, and they never kept a record of it. How do they prove they had the money? Well, that can be hard. It can be really hard. So the IRS says what you can do in a situation like that is keep a ledger of each person that paid you throughout the year and the date that they paid you and how much they paid you. And if you keep that ledger, that can be proof. Or maybe you do take a certain amount of the cash that has come in and deposit it into a bank account, if they have a bank account. So those types of things can be done to support income, and the IRS does accept those as long as the records are there. Now, if you go to the IRS website, they actually have a training module on the earned income credit. It's a pretty good one. I'm going to show it to you real quick because I think it's pretty great. And it's really revealing. In, in that respect, you don't have to take my word for it on what it is that the IRS wants to see and is willing to accept. I'm going to show you what they're willing to accept and where you can go to learn more. Okay, finally got it to a point where I can go to a URL. And where I'm going to go is I'm just going to go to iris.gov. Tribble. T-R-I-B-B-L-E, Tribble. Here. And then I click on here, EIC homepage. It has a link here for tax professionals, and I click on it. And then it talks about hot topics for preparers, and I click on it. And I get to a screen where it says it's now time to leave the IRS's website. And you want that because it's going to take you to where all that good stuff is. You know those colored posters that I have in my manual and other literature that you can show your clients? This is where you go for them. You get to this page. All of the information contained on this particular page is geared towards tax professionals and is aimed at two things. One is making sure that tax professionals understand their due diligence requirements and the other is with providing education on what the rules for the earned income credit are. And if you land on the page, you will see instructions on how the earned income credit works. In other words, what's it about? It'll provide information on frequently asked questions, essentially taking you through the earned income credit tests. And you can see here we've got the age, relationship, and residency rules, basic qualifications, and there's even a page here for divorced and separated parents. When you land on it, there's a series of questions and what the IRS has to say about it. So even this page in and of itself can be a useful tool. If you've got a client in front of you and they have a question, they've got a marital status situation where you do have divorced or separated parents, and they want to know how the IRS would react to a particular position. So let's take a look at this one. Prepare a question. If the parents are divorced, may the non-custodial parent claim the dependency exemption and the dependent care credit and the custodial parent claim the earned income tax credit? And the answer is no. Generally, only one person may claim all the child-related tax benefits for a child, including the dependency exemption, the child tax credit, and the dependent care credit. 
the exclusion for dependent care benefits, head of household filing status, and the earned income credit. However, there is an exception, and there is a special rule for divorced or separated parents or parents who lived apart for the last six months of the calendar year. And it goes on to describe all of the rules that we talked about in our class. So the fact that you can actually show this page to your customer on the IRS website I think is a useful tool, especially if you have a client who is second-guessing you. Now, if we continue down the page, you can see that we get to a link which offers due diligence videos. And on this page, that's where you go and you find some pretty good videos. One of my favorite is this one on record keeping. You click on the record keeping video, and I'll just play a segment of it for you here. I was cleaning up my digital files one morning, getting everything in order for another tax season. When she walked in, Why, Mrs. Davis, what an unexpected pleasure. Sorry not to call. So in this particular video, the IRS is showing a situation where we have a hairdresser with very poor records. And what is a tax practitioner you can do to help your client in a similar situation put together the records necessary to file the return and even make a claim for the earned income credit. The next video I'm going to show you is this one called Qualifying Child. Just when you think you've seen it all, someone comes along and opens your eyes. <laughs> How can I help Anyway, you? They're, they're quite comical, they're humorous, they're entertaining, and they teach you about what IRS expects from, in the case of due diligence from tax preparers. So well worth the time to watch. So otherwise on the IRS website, we also have tools and tips and publications and other products and a link for educational opportunities. So on the publications and products page, there are a variety of IRS publications, including publication 596 that are available for you to download, as well as brochures, other items that you can hang in your offices, posters that you can put on display for your clients as well. Some of these products are also uh, available in Spanish, Chinese, Vietnamese, and other languages. And here is the English-Spanish poster, Will You Qualify for the Earned Income Credit This Year? And it offers it again in Spanish. So if you service large numbers of clients in Spanish, maybe you don't speak Spanish so well yourself, but here is some information that you can hang up for them. Finally, it is possible to obtain some free CPE from the IRS. They do have a link from this site where you can go get some free CPE. It is called the EITC Due Diligence Training Module. And you click on the link to reach this page, and then you click on the link again, and it takes you to this page where you need to create a login account for yourself. You identify the type of tax professional you are as enrolled agent or other, you enter your PTIN, and you be can begin this training module. And at the end of it, you should receive some free CPE credit. And returning to the IRS's main earned income credit tax site, on this IRS page, you can see that there is a module called EITC Preparer Compliance Targeted, Tailored, and Tiered. And on this page, IRS is going out of its way to explain to you what it's doing to encourage compliance within the tax practitioner community and uh, why they have compliance program. And you can see here that they are saying that they estimate that 21 to 26 percent of all EITC claims have some kind of mistake which costs the government up to $15 billion in 2011. On another page, the IRS says that 60% of all IRS EITC claims are prepared by paid professionals. So if you took this ratio, then you could say that essentially, whether it's an individual return or a paid preparer return, the likelihood of an error is going to be the same. And in fact, I've read some IRS sources or some research sources published by the General Accounting Office that says when a paid preparer does a return, the odds of there being an error are frequently higher than when an individual does the return. So coming back to that scenario, if you're looking at the majority of EITC claims being prepared by paid preparers and that a quarter, fully 25% of the EITC claims out there have been prepared 
at least in some part incorrectly or sometimes even grossly incorrectly, that's the reason why the IRS has put so much focus on due diligence requirements, training requirements for the tax preparer community. Next, we're moving on to the head of household, as I've already said. Determining head of household means applying the law and knowing what the rules for head of household are, and I certainly hope we've covered that with you for today. Determining the correct amount of income, different ways that you can do that is to conduct a thorough and in-depth interview of your client about their business activity, review any supporting material they have, educate them on the need and importance of record keeping and the consequences of failing to keep good records, guide them through reconstruction of income and expenses if necessary, develop a sound and reasonable estimate of your client's business income and expenses using resources such as appointment calendars or appointment books, online map tools like MapQuest to calculate different distances for mileage logs, checkbook registers, cancel checks, bank statements or credit card statements, lists of their regular clients. So a child daycare provider, she may not know exactly how much income she earned for the year, but she would know each person she provided daycare for and how much she charged them. And if she would go through and list all of that, she could come up with a pretty close number, couldn't she? Partial receipts, maybe they don't have all of them, but they at least have some of them. Cell phone records and prior year returns are all tools that you can use. Prepare penalties can be steep. The IRS can assess a penalty of $500 against both you and your employer for each failure to comply with the due diligence requirements. A minimum penalty can apply if you prepare a client return and the IRS finds that any part of the amount tax owed or due is due to an unreasonable position. A minimum penalty of $5,000 can apply if you prepare a client return and the IRS finds that any part of the amount of taxes owed is due to your reckless or intentional disregard of the rules or regulations. You could lose your status as an enrolled agent, and if we clarify this registered tax return preparer status, it's still up in limbo right now, but if it is established that that status will remain intact, that also could be reneged. Suspension or expulsion of you or your firm from IRS e-file, and that's a big one. The criteria for getting into IRS e-file are strict, and if you are not an authorized e-file provider, IRS essentially says that you can't prepare tax returns if you do more than 10 a year, so that's a big one. Or injunctions barring you from preparing tax returns altogether. So what are some of the IRS enforcement efforts impacting tax preparers? Well, essentially, there's several different levels of enforcement going on. Some of those enforcements are really geared around knowledge, basically educating the tax preparer. And if you go to the IRS website, that EITC module, that exists for educational purposes. Beyond that, if the IRS decides, based on statistical evidence that's coming into them, that you have a higher than average error rate on earned income credit tax returns that you are filing for your clients, they're probably going to send you a letter. And the letter is going to say, you know, we've been looking at the tax returns you're filing, and we have disallowed several earned income credit claims this year. That's higher than average, and so you're on notice. And you're on notice in multiple ways. You need to get yourself educated, and you need to shape up. And if you don't shape up, you could be subject to fines, and that's when the next thing comes. And eventually they can send you nastier letters and actually come out and make office calls where they demand to see the procedures you're using to determine earned income credit. They're going to ask to see your interview records, and they can start imposing fines if you have failed to do that. So here's an example of one of the letters that could go out to you. You may have violated the law by submitting an inaccurate tax return. The next letter that comes up, is you may have violated the law by uh, submitting an earned income credit return that's false, and it goes on. I think that's just multiple pages of the same document. Here's the next one, alert. <laughs> Why are you receiving this later? Based on a recent internal review, a large number of the returns you prepared had errors. And then the next one, there's more that are similar after that. So again, the IRS due diligence training module, I actually did put a link to it in the manual for today's class. So if you want to find it the hard way, the way I showed you just by searching for it, you can do that or you can click on the link in the module. So that concludes the review of the earned income credit. I'm now going to do a quick review of the child tax credit and then we're going to use the last bit of today's class to actually look at the finished tax returns that I prepared for Jack and Sylvia. The additional child tax credit is claimed on Form 1040 line 65. The child tax credit is a non-refundable credit that can reduce your tax. If your tax liability is zero and you qualified for the child tax credit, you may then qualify for the additional child tax credit. The additional child tax credit is a refundable credit 
and it is intended to refund certain taxpayers a portion or all of the Social Security and Medicare withholdings on their W-2s. And in fact, in these days, it usually refunds more, far more than was withheld on the W-2s. But when the additional child tax credit was first introduced, it was introduced specifically to refund withholdings for Social Security and Medicare taxes on the W-2s. And then after a few years, it moved up to just giving flat dollar amounts regardless of what was withheld on W-2s. How do you figure the additional credit? Well, there are two different methods for calculating the amount of additional child tax credit that you can claim. If you qualify for both methods, you should use the method which gives you the largest credit. And we have the rule for taxpayers who have one or more qualifying children. To qualify for the additional child tax credit with one or more children, you must meet all of the following rules. Firstly, you have to have one or more qualifying children for whom you can claim a dependency exemption. And you must have more than $3,000 of income. Also, you can't owe any federal tax. That is, when you're on your tax return, you get to line 55, it's got a zero on it. <laughs> All of your tax has been erased by other credits or deductions that you have. So you've got this surplus additional credit that could be refunded to you because of that. And finally, you need to complete and attach Schedule 8812 to your tax return. Now, even if your earned income was less than 3000 you may still qualify for the additional child tax credit if you have three or more children. And the rules for taxpayers with three or more qualifying children, you would have to complete Part 2 of Schedule 8812. And again, you have to have three or more children for that. You have to owe no federal tax. You must complete Part 2 of 8812, and you must have paid into Social Security and Medicare tax, or if you're self-employed, have paid self-employment tax. How do you calculate the credit? Well, firstly, there's part one of the form, and part one of the form only applies if you are preparing a tax return for an individual who is claiming a dependent who has an ITIN. With the earned income credit, you cannot award earned income credit to a child who has an ITIN. That child must have a valid social security number. But that rule does not apply to children for the additional child tax credit. A child can qualify for the additional child tax credit with an ITIN. They don't have to have a social security number for additional child tax credit. However, the IRS has noticed that there's a lot of people getting the additional child tax credit for children living in Mexico. And so beginning with 2012, they've added this extra section up at the top. And any time you have a client that claims the child tax credit for a child who has an ITIN, Schedule 8812 is required, even if they're not claiming the refundable part of the child tax credit, only the non-refundable. So either way, and what it says is answer the following questions for each dependent listed on Form 1040, Line 6A, who has an ITIN. And the question is, for the first dependent identified with an ITIN and listed as a qualifying child for the child tax credit, did this child meet the substantial presence test? Well, the substantial presence test, you'd actually have to look at the rules for what makes you considered to be a resident alien under U.S. tax law. And under U.S. tax law, the broad definition of a resident alien is someone who has lived inside of the United States for more than 183 days during the year. There are other criteria for establishing residency, but just kind of loosely in your head, was the child physically inside of the United States for more than half the year? If they have an ITIN, it must be the case. And if they were, then you would answer yes. And if they were not, you would answer no. And if you answer no, that child does not qualify for either the child tax credit or the additional child tax credit. Then in part two, the purpose of this section is to determine whether or not you have earned income and whether or not your earned income exceeds $3,000. So let's suppose you have a W-2 that is for $10,000. Well, your W-2 for $10,000 shows that you have earned income that is $7,000 more than $3,000. And just as a loose formula here, I can tell you that the formula for calculating the additional child tax credit is you take your earned income, and let's just suppose in this case it's $10,000, and from that you subtract $3,000, and that gives you a number. And in this case it's going to obviously be $7,000. The next step in the formula is to multiply the difference between 3,000 and what you made by 15%. So if we take 7,000, multiply that by 15%, we're going to get the amount of additional child tax credit we could potentially qualify for. Now, we can never qualify for more than the difference between these. So if I take 7,000 and multiply it by 15%, I get $1,050. 
That's the net result there. 7,000 times 15% is $1,050. If I have one qualifying child and my tax liability up on line 55 is zero and I did not use any of my child tax credit up above, then the maximum child tax credit I could possibly qualify for is $1,000. This formula gives me $1,050, but I won't get $1,050. I'll only get $1,000. But let's suppose I have two qualifying children. The maximum potential child tax credit I could get with two qualifying children is $2,000, but I cannot get more than the difference between my earned income for the year and $3,000 multiplied by 15%. So if that difference is $7,000, I multiply it by 15%. The most additional child tax credit I can get is $1,050. And if I used any of my child tax credit up above to reduce my tax to zero, when I get down to this point, it, let's just say up top I have two children and I used up $1,500 of my child tax credit up top. I get down to the bottom and my child tax credit starts at 2000 but I have to subtract out 1500 500 is all that's left, and that's all I could get. So this is just kind of help you understand the math or the logic behind the additional child tax credit. Now, when the additional child tax credit was first allowed under this provision where your earned income exceeds a certain dollar amount, that dollar amount was actually set at $10,000, and it was indexed for inflation and went up each year. But as we were bringing in, or our government was bringing in economic stimulus measures to push money into the economy, that $10,000 number that had been adjusted for inflation actually dropped. And I think it initially dropped to something like $7,000, and then it dropped to $3,000, and it's now been at $3,000 for several years. But one of the things that could potentially expire is this lower number of $3,000. And if in a future year that $3,000 lower amount is taken away and it returns to $10,000 index for inflation, you would see a lot of people who've been receiving additional child tax credit suddenly not qualifying for it anymore. Then in part three of the form, there is space provided for figuring the additional child tax credit for people who have three or more children. Really, the only time you're going to benefit more by part three than you do in part two is when the income is very low, say below 3000 or when you're dealing with a situation of a person who might have multiple dependents at home and they don't qualify for the earned income credit because they have ITINs. And in situations like that, part three rarely, but sometimes does give the bigger number. I have an illustration here of a character named Rusty Spoon. He is a single parent with three qualifying children named Linda, Taylor, and Jake, who were all under age 17 and lived with him all year. Rusty paid more than half the cost of supporting his household, his W-2 shown below, figure the amount of EIC and child tax credit that he can claim. He has a $25,000 W-2, and let's move on to take a look at his 1040. Clearly, starting on the 1040, we have to list the names of each of the children he's claiming. We list his filing status as head of household. We list the relationship of the children to him. And we can see the order of the children here is listed Linda, Taylor, and Jake. And we've checked the box to indicate that each of those is a qualifying child for purposes of the child tax credit. We list his W-2 income as $25,000. And then we move over to page two of the tax return. Now on page two, we claim a standard deduction of $8,700. And we also claim exemption deductions for our filer, Rusty, and his three dependents. And when we enter those, we end up with $15,200 of exemption deduction. And when we're all done, the $25,000 of income that Rusty earned for the year, only $1,100 of it is taxable, and the tax on that is $111. Rusty's child tax credit cannot exceed his tax so his tax credit for the child tax credit is limited to $111. That makes the number on line 55 zero. And because line 55 is zero, we're going, ah, he can qualify for an additional child tax credit. So let's go figure out what that is. Ultimately, when we're done, he qualifies for an additional child tax credit of $28.89. And the math behind that is three qualifying children minus the 111 he's already claimed, that gives you 2889. And how do we know he qualifies for the maximum 3000? Well, we would take 25,000 of wage, subtract out $3,000 limit, multiply the difference by 15%. And when I do that, I go 25,000 minus 3000 equals 22,000 and I multiply that by 15%, $3300. 
Well, he's not going to get a $3,300 credit because he's only got three qualifying children, so we start at three. But he's allowed the full three and not less than three, except for the fact he already claimed 111 here. So that's where the 2889 came from. And then based on $25,000 of income with three qualifying children, we go to the earned income credit table and we come up with $4,219. So he's getting an $8,108 refund, 7,108 of which is a refund to him of money he never paid into the system. And then moving on to the earned income credit schedule, look at the, the way that my software has ordered things. We have Jake, Linda, and Taylor. And on the front of the return, we have Linda, Taylor, and Jake. And that's something to be on the lookout for when you're answering those questions, because the software automatically lists the children with the youngest child first. And you can see that the birth year is listed for each of these children, the relationship, and the number of months that the children were in the house. On the next page, we have the child tax credit form filled out. Part one is blank because the children all have social security numbers. And then we see the math going on here, 3,000. We take 22,000, which is 25,000 minus three. We multiply that difference by 15%. We get 3,300. We're limited to 3,000 minus the 111. And part three is blank because it provides a smaller result. We end up with 2889 and we claim it. This is an example of the Earned Income Credit Worksheet. It shows how we computed the Earned Income Credit, and that's shown right here. So that concludes the lecture I have for you today on the Federal Credits for Families Who Have Children. In the last few minutes of the class, I'm going to open up the answer key for our filers and show you what it is that I have for Jack and Sylvia on their return. And it's a fairly lengthy, detailed answer key that's fair and reasonable for the complexity of the problem I gave you. The answer key is inside the LMS Open Campus. You will be able to go there and print it and read it on your own time. At any rate, here we have the answer key for federal credits for families with children. And we start off just by rewording the problem. And then we get into the questions for discussion. Well, what is the filing status of Jack? The answer is head of household. The fact that you need to consider is that he paid more than half the cost of keeping up the household, even though he has the lower income. Sylvia has higher income, but she didn't pay more than half the cost of keeping up the house. So Sylvia does not qualify for head of household status, but she still does qualify for her qualifying children to claim their dependency exemption, the child independent care credit, the child tax credit, and the earned income credit. Which children could Sylvia claim as dependents on her return? She could claim Ben, Becky, and Jonathan. She cannot claim George or Samantha because they are the qualifying children of Jack, and they would merely be her qualifying relatives. Now, a point on Jonathan. I told you that Jack and Sylvia paid for his support equally, but Jonathan is a qualifying relative, and if you go over to the qualifying relative rules, they state that the only time you can claim an exemption for a person under the qualifying relative test is if you can show that you paid more than half the cost of that person's support. Well, if Jack and Sylvia paid for the support of Jonathan equally, it means neither of them paid more than half. And so they would fall into something that's called a multiple support agreement. And under the rules for a multiple support agreement, whoever claims Jonathan will need to have the other person release Jonathan to them by signing form 2120 and then 2120 multiple support agreement would be attached to the return. So which children should or could Jack claim as dependents? Well, the answer is he can claim George, Samantha, Becky, and Jonathan. Ben is not an option. Name the children Sylvia could claim for the child tax credit. The answer is Ben and Becky. The children that Jack could claim for the child tax credit are George, Samantha, and Becky. Which children could Sylvia claim for EIC? It's the same as the child tax credit, Ben and Becky. And for Jack, it's George, Samantha, and Becky. Can Sylvia claim the child independent care credit? And if yes, for which child or children? The answer is Sylvia paid expenses for Becky. She can claim the expenses for Becky, but only if she claims Becky's exemption. Jack paid expenses, but only for George. And uh, in order to claim the expenses for George, he would have to claim George's dependency. But George isn't even up in the air. Becky is up in the air. She could move from Sylvia to Jack, but George could not move from Jack to Becky because George is not related to Becky. So what are the possible tax return scenarios and possible refund amounts for Jack? Compute those using the information that I gave you in today's class. And to help you with the answer key here, what I've got is an insert here of the earned income credit table based on Jack's income level. 
If your income is at least 26000 but less than 2650 you follow this bar across to pull out the correct earned income credit. If Jack claims one child, his EIC would be 1741 If he claims two, it's 3354 And if he claims three, it's 4009 So if we go down and look at the chart here, these are the potential scenarios for Jack. He could claim some George and Samantha. He could claim George, Samantha, and Becky. He could claim George, Samantha, and Jonathan, or he could claim George, Samantha, Becky, and Jonathan. Now, he can only claim Becky if Sylvia uh, releases Becky to him, and that's because Sylvia wins under the tiebreaker rules. Her income is higher. But because they're both the parents of Becky, either of them can claim Becky, and it is potentially that we, the case that we could give Becky to Jack. So what I've done here on the table is uh, across the line, you can see that the AGI is the same regardless of who Jack claims, and his filing status is the same regardless of who he claims. But the exemption deduction, that will vary depending on how many dependents he claims. And so that amount can go up. It can reach a high over here of 19,000 when he claims all of the dependents. But you can see that what happens when he claims all of the dependents, his taxable income drops to zero. And as soon as his taxable income drops to zero, he has no tax. And if he has no tax, he gains no benefit whatsoever from claiming the child care credit that he paid. So the child care expense of $500 really only works for him and gives him a tax benefit if he can show that he actually has a tax liability to offset it. So if he claims only three children rather than four, he would be in a situation where he will benefit from the child care credit. Now, if he claims George and Samantha, his income tax is fairly high. It comes out at $593. He'll use his child care credit in full of $145. He'll also have to use up some of his potential additional child tax credit as a non-refundable child tax credit. He would use up $448, reduce his tax to zero. His earned income credit based on two children would be $33.54, and his additional child tax credit would be the difference of $15.52, and he would arrive at a refund of $4,906 from credits. If he claims George, Samantha, and Becky, he goes through all of these same calculations. He would only have $66 of child tax credit, making his refundable child tax credit a higher number. If he claims George, Samantha, and Jonathan, he ends up with a refund from credits of 5288, and if he claims all of the children available to him, he gets a refund of 7009. Now moving over to Sylvia. Sylvia can never qualify for earned income credit on three children. The most she can qualify for is two children, Ben and Becky. And in this column and this column, you can see we've awarded her Becky and earned income credit associated with Becky. An important thing goes on here in terms of the child care credit in that if she does not claim Becky, she's going to lose the $725 tax benefit associated with Becky. And also, if she does claim Ben, Becky, and Jonathan, her taxable income gets to be a low enough number that she's going to put her tax down to zero and not be able to use all of her child care credit. So there is a mathematical equation here where Sylvia and Jack come out on top. And it turns out to be this formula right here. The answer is that Jack should claim George, Samantha, and Jonathan, and Sylvia should claim Ben and Becky. They can come up with a different formula if they want, but if they want their family to come out with a maximum potential refund, that's going to happen in this column right here where Jack claims George, Samantha, and Jonathan, and Sylvia claims Ben and Becky. And when that happens, you get a $5,288 refund for Jack, a $4,853 refund for Becky, and an overall refund for this family of $10,141. Close to that, but still a little bit less, $90 less roughly, is when we give George and Samantha to Jack and give Ben, Becky, and Jonathan to Sylvia. So Jonathan's kind of a swing one. Whoever claims him, there's a minor benefit associated with it, but it's a few bucks to the advantage to give Jonathan to Jack over giving him to Sylvia. But when it comes to Becky, it is far better for this family to put Becky with Sylvia than it is to put Becky with Jack. So that concludes our class called Federal Credits for Families with Children. So let's take a look here now at the Session 13 classwork assignment, and there's actually three classwork assignments, and the answer keys that goes with them. And the first one we have up is classwork assignment number one. And 
the it's a series of just true and false questions, but normally this would be encompassed into a quiz, and in this case it's a classwork assignment. And in this one we're really just taking a look at some of the rules surrounding the child and dependent care credit. And you're supposed to answer true or false to each question. So let's begin with question number one. Janice's husband, Harry, was disabled and unable to care for himself for the entire year. Janice hired an attendant to care for her husband in their home while she was at work. Janice and Harry will file a joint return. They are eligible to claim the child independent care credit. And of course, the answer to this question is true. Although normally both parents, most adults, must both work in order to claim the child independent care credit, in a situation where one spouse is disabled and incapable of self-care, it is only necessary for one spouse to actually work. And the spouse that is not working is treated as if they had income for purposes of calculating gross earnings test. Uh, question number two, Laura is single. She paid her 18-year-old son, Sam, to care for her younger children while she was at work. Laura will not be able to claim Sam as her dependent. Laura can claim the child independent care credit. And of course, uh, in this situation, we're definitely going to have to have a false. Uh, firstly, for, well, there, the main reason here is that the son is under the age of 19. In order to claim child and dependent care credit for expenses paid to your child, your child must be age 19 or older, and in this case, the child is age 18. Question number three, Jill is married to Jack. Jack left Jill and moved out of the home on May 1. Jill worked and supported their two children, ages 8 and 10, for the remainder of the year. Jill worked all year and paid more than half the cost of maintaining her household. She paid for before and after school care for her children while she was at work. She will not be filing a joint return with Jack. Jill can claim the child independent care credit. But what we're looking for here is, is Jill going to meet the test for being considered unmarried when she is in fact married so that she can then use the head of household filing status? Because, of course, if she files married filing separately, the child independent care credit is out. So the only way to claim the credit is to meet the tests for uh, being considered unmarried so that she can file as head of household. And in this case, her husband moved out of the house in the first half of the year, and that means she was n not living with her spouse at any time in the second half of the year. So she meets that requirement. She has a qualifying child living with her for whom she can claim uh, an exemption, and, uh, of course, she paid more than half the cost of keeping up a household for those children. And so she passes all of the tests for being considered unmarried and qualifies for the head of household filing status. And as such, she will be able to claim the child and a dependent care credit. So A, true, is the correct answer. Number four, Betty and John are married. Betty worked all year. John was unemployed and looking for work for two months and a full-time student for seven months. Their two-year-old daughter was enrolled at a preschool whenever John was at school or looking for work. Betty and John will be able to claim the child independent care credit on their joint return. And this is another true answer. And in this case, if you go over and look at question number four, true, the credit can be claimed for the months John was either a student or out job hunting. And you must prorate the credit at a rate of $250 for each month he was actually going to school or looking for work. So if John was a student for all 12 months, the allowable expense would be 3000 but since John was looking for work or was a student for 9 out of 12 months, then his allowable expense would be 9 times 250 or $2,250. Question number five, Sally and Joe are married and both work full time. Sally's mother, Winifred, lives with them and cares for their five-year-old son. They pay Winifred to care for their son. Winifred is not their dependent. Sally and Joe can claim the child independent care credit. Well, the answer to this question is true. You can claim a child and independent care credit if you pay expenses to an individual, including a person who is related to you, provided that person is not your dependent. And in this case, we're clearly telling you that although Winifred is related, she is not a dependent. And so uh, question number five, true, they can claim that expense. Six, Jackie is separated from her spouse, Tim. They did not live together at any time during the year. Tim pays child support for to Jackie, and she has signed Form 8332 granting Tim the dependency exemption for their child. Jackie worked all year and paid daycare expenses for her three-year-old child. She can claim the child independent care credit. And again, this is another true answer. In this particular situation, it is not necessary for Jackie to claim her child's dependency exemption because she meets the exception for the rules governing uh, children of divorced and separated parents. 
uh, her, her ex-husband, uh, separated husband, is claiming the dependency exemption, but she still meets all of the additional tests for claiming the head of household filing status and claiming the child as a dependent. Let's move on now to classwork assignment number two. Classwork assignment number two requests that you prepare a tax return for a character named Powder Blue. In this problem, you're going to be preparing Form 1040, a Schedule A, a 2441, and an 8339. And your job is to determine uh, how much of a, a child independent care credit that Powder Blue is going to be able to claim as well as the amount of the adoption credit. Powder works as a manager and is married to Sue Blue, who is a homemaker, but also a full-time student at Ohio State University. Sue attended OSU all months of the year except June, July, and August. She received a full scholarship and had no educational expenses. On June 1 of 2012, the Blues finalized the form of adoption of their daughters, Sally Blue and Cindy Blue. The Blues incurred the following expenses, and you can see here that Sally has expenses of $13,000 that were paid in 2011 and another $7,000 paid in 2012. For Cindy, the expenses paid in 2011 totaled $6,000, and those paid in 2012 totaled $7,000. During the year, the Blues paid Little Ones child care at 3030 Little Ones Lane, Cincinnati, Ohio, $8,000 to care for Sally and Cindy while Powder worked and Sue went to school. The children attended the school from July through December for six months. The Blues live at 14 Tang Lane. They paid $20,000 in mortgage interest and $4,500 for property taxes. They also had $1,000 of dividend income. Their W-2s are attached. Uh, and represent the Blues' total earned income for the year, go ahead and prepare their federal return. And you can see here we've got a single W-2 issued to Powder Blue showing $179,000 of wage income and $25,000 of federal withholding along with another $15,000 of state withholding. So at this point, please push pause on the video playback and prepare a tax return for Powder Blue. And when you are ready, please resume video playback for a review of the answer key. And I have up on the screen in front of you now the answer key for classwork assignment number two. It represents a preparation of a tax return for a filer who is itemizing deductions and claiming two important tax credits, the first of which is the child and the dependent care credit, and the second of which is the adoption credit. Several rules need to be applied in determining the amount of each of these two types of credits. So let's look at the introduction here on the answer key. Powder and Sue Blue have adopted two foreign children. This means that the expenses they paid in 2011 were not claimable in 2011. They are claimed in the year the adoption becomes final. 2012 is the year that the adoption became final, and so even though the expenses were paid in 11, they're treated as if they were paid in 12. And so we go down and we total up the expenses paid for Sally, the expenses paid for Cindy, and we can see that we have $20,000 of qualifying expense for Sally and $13,000 of qualifying expense for Cindy. So there's a, some important calculations to bear in mind. When we get down to the Form 2441, an important piece of information to make note of is that for the period of time Sue Blue was a student and they had the children for whom they were paying child care expenses, we're going to be able to claim a child dependent care credit. But Sue can claim credit only for the amount of income she is deemed to have earned during the period of time she was a student and was paying child care expense. Now, Sue didn't receive any other income during the year, so she's going to be limited to that calculation. And the way the calculation works is she can claim $250 per child for each month she attended school and, of course, while those children were in daycare. Sue attended school for the entire year. However, the children were enrolled in child care for only four of the months that Sue attended school. This means that Sue can claim four months times 250 per child times two children for a total cost of $2,000. Let's take a look now at preparation of Form 2441 for the Blues. This is a rather complex calculation that's going on because we have to take into account a number of factors. Firstly, the Blues can claim a child independent care credit when they are paying a child care expense to enable Sue to attend school. In the wording of the problem, we tell you she was in school all year except June, July, and August. And we also tell you that the children arrived into the Blues home on the 1st of June, 
and then they attended child care for six months, basically July through December. However, we can see that in July and August, Sue was not in school. Therefore, we have a situation where Sue was in school and the children were going to child care at the same time for the last four months of the year, essentially September, October, November, December. So there are four months of the year where the child independent care credit can be claimed, but we also have to factor in the fact that Sue had no earned income all year, and so she's going to have to get credit for some amount of earned income in order to be able to claim this credit. And the way the rules work is you are allowed to claim a credit of $250 per child per month that you have qualifying expenses. So in this case, there are two children at $250 times four months, and when we do that calculation, we end up with a $2,000 qualifying expenses of $2,000 that will be used to calculate the child and dependent care credit. So let's go down and take a look, firstly, at the 1040 form for the blues. And we can see that we've entered the income from the uh, W-2 for powder as well as $1,000 of dividend income. Gives them a nice round number of $180,000 of adjusted gross income for the year. We're itemizing their deductions, and their Schedule A shows $39,500 of itemized deductions. And when we figure calculating the tax, we end up with $23,385 of tax. You will see that the Blues qualify for child independent care credit, and we've entered that amount on line 48. It's $400, but their income is too high, so they will not receive a child tax credit. That line 51 is blank. We then also have checked box C on line 53, and we've entered the amount of adoption credit that they qualify for. And you will note that the total credits claimed on line 54 cannot be more than their tax. The net tax on line 55 is zero, and their $25,000 of withholding will be refunded to them in full. Here is the Schedule A for the Blues, and we can see $15,000 of income tax withheld on Powder's W-2, $4,500 of real estate tax, $20,000 of mortgage interest, and that's where we got the $39,500 of items deductions. On to the Child Independent Care Credit form, we show the name of the provider and the address of the provider along with the identifying number of the provider and the amount of expense paid to the provider for the six months the, child, the children were in that provider's care. But now we have to look at how much expense is qualified expense for each child. And in this case, we're allocating the expense equally between the two. There's $4,000 of expense for Cindy and $4,000 of expense for Sally. We then go down and look at the amount of earned income that they had for the year. And uh, the earned income that is represented here is Powder's income of 179000 But we also have to take into account the amount of earned income that uh, Cindy is treated as having. And Cindy can only receive $500 of income for each month uh, for purposes of calculating this credit that her children were in child care while she was attending school. And ultimately that was $500 times four months or $2,000 of expense. So she will use $2,000 of qualifying income uh, per se. She's treated as having $2,000 of income to calculate the credit. And they're going to qualify for the lowest rate of the credit, which is 20% based on their income. And 20% of $2,000 is $400. Next we have the adoption credit, and in this case we have Sally Blue and Cindy Blue. We're showing that the year the child was born and the fact that this is a foreign adoption. And uh, then we also check the box to show that the adoption became final in 2012 or earlier. We show the amount of uh, the maximum potential adoption credit for each child on line two. And then on line five, we enter the actual qualifying expenses paid for each child. And we're going to claim the lesser of the maximum adoption credit possible or the qualifying expense paid for each child. In this case, the maximum credit allowed is $12,650 12, per child, and that is the amount that is entered on the form. However, when we total up line 11 and line 6, if we, if we total up line 6, you will see that we get a number that is in excess of $25,000. 12,650 times two, you're gonna go over 25,000. So why do we have only 22,985 entered on line 12? Well, the answer is that that is the liability shown on line 53 of their form 1040. And what it means is that they will have a carry forward 
for 2013, and they will be able to claim the remainder of their adoption credit in 2013. And moving on to classwork assignment number three, this classwork assignment is very similar to the one we just did for the blues. It involves all of the same forms, but we've rearranged the situation a little bit just to give it a new twist. In this problem, we have Linda Danvers, who is single and resides on Argo Way, and she finalized the adoption of a special needs child named Sorel. Sorel lived with Linda all year, but she had no adoption expenses. Linda paid $8,000 for childcare during the year to Super Tykes. She is a homeowner and she paid $10,000 of mortgage interest and $3,000 in real estate taxes. Go ahead and prepare her return. So at this point, please push pause on video playback and complete the tax return for Linda Danvers. When you are ready, resume playback and we'll do a review of the answer key. And returning to review the Classwork 3 answer key, there's just some key points that we've highlighted for you on the answer key. Firstly, Zorel is Linda's qualifying child. He will qualify her for the child tax credit and head of household filing status. When we get over to the adoption credit, because Linda has adopted a special needs child, she's going to be eligible to claim the adoption credit even though she had no adoption expenses. She will complete Form 8839 and claim $12,650 of allowable expenses. Her allowable credit is not affected by her income because it is below the phase-out range. The adoption of Zorel was finalized during the year, and this means he is Linda's qualifying child, and as such, he qualifies her for both the child tax credit and the child independent care credit. Linda's W-2, however, though, let's take a look at it right here, shows that she received dependent care benefits totaling $5,000 for the year. And what happens is uh, when she has only a single qualifying child, the maximum expense she can use to calculate the child independent care credit is $3,000. The dependent care benefits she received are more than that, so ultimately her credit amount will be zero. But because she has dependent care benefits showing up on box 10 of her W-2, she is still required to complete Form 2441 to acknowledge the fact that she has received that benefit and to also show that she has spent at least $5,000 or more on qualifying expenses. So again, here is Linda's tax return. We're showing that she is head of household. She's got a single dependent. Her wage income for the year is $135,000. On to page two, we show itemized deductions of $19,350. We're showing that she is claiming an adoption credit in the amount of $12,650. Uh, but she earns too much to receive the child tax credit, and she also uh, does not qualify to claim the child independent care credit because she had no qualifying expense per se, and we'll show she really has qualifying expense, but not, and not for the credit. We'll see how that works when we get to the 2441. Her credit offsets her tax and reduces her liability from 21658 down to 9008 That is less than her withholding, and she is due a $10,000 refund for the year. On to Schedule A, we can show that the income tax withheld under W-2 right here is $6,350. We carry that to line 5. She paid $3,000 of real estate tax, $10,000 of mortgage interest. You add those numbers up and you have 19,350 of itemized deductions. On to the 2441, as I said, the form is required. We enter Super Tykes Daycare and the amount of qualifying expense paid. On Zorel, we show the amount of qualifying expense paid for Zorel, but not more than the amount paid to the provider minus the amount shown on the W-2. So we take $8,000 paid to the provider, we subtract out the amount shown on the W-2 of $5,000, and what's left is $3,000. We then go over to page 2 of Form 2441, and we show on page uh, 2 of 2441 that the amount of dependent care benefit through work is $5,000, and that $5,000 essentially reduces her qualifying expense down to zero. None of the benefits are taxable, which is good for Linda, but she doesn't get a credit either. And then on to Form 8839. On Form 8839, we're going to enter the year of birth of the child, and we're going to show in Box D that this is a special needs adoption. We show the amount of child care, uh, the maximum amount of adoption credit possible, and the fact that she is qualifying for that full credit, and that carries over to her Form 1040. So that concludes the review of the Session 13 Classwork Answer Keys. At this point, the course is fairly much complete for Part 1. You still need to take the Part 1 quiz 
for session 13, and you should also prepare for exams by taking the true and false quiz that asks questions from all the way from session 1 through session 13 of the basic tax course. It's a good opportunity to practice and refresh on all earlier sessions. And I'll see you back here with session 14 after you've completed your midterm exams. Thanks, and bye-bye. And here we are with the Session 13 quiz review. This is the final quiz and review of the first half of the basic tax course. At this point, after you complete the Session 13 quiz review, it's really going to be time to go back and revisit all of the previous quizzes from the first half of the basic tax course as you study and prepare to take the closed book midterm exam. As an aside the point, we did want you to uh, be aware of the fact that our quizzes include only multiple choice questions, and this is because the quality assurance portion of NASBA requires that all questions be multiple choice, as does CTEC, the California Tax Education Council. They require that all questions we provide in our quizzes that qualify for credit contain uh, multiple choice questions. But it happens to be the case that both the federal C exam and the Oregon exams do have lots of true and false questions in them. And if you are a student who is preparing either for the IRS C exam or the Oregon LTC or LTP exams, you'll probably want to take, an, take the opportunity to look at some true false questions. And so Pacific Northwest Tax School has inserted into session 13 a list of true false questions, or basically a whole bunch of quiz questions that are true false questions. And they go all the way back from session one all the way through session 13. And as you are studying and preparing for the closed book midterm exam, we do recommend that you review the true false questions that we have just as a study tool. And then of course, revisit all of the quiz questions that you've been taking since session one. So with that brief introduction, let's move on to a review of the session 13 quiz, beginning with question number one. Alice is single. She has three relatives living with her, her two children, ages eight and 13, her bedridden aunt, who could be her dependent except her income was over 3,800. What is the maximum amount of qualifying expenses Alice can use when computing her child and dependent care credit? Well, the answer is the maximum is $3,000 per qualifying person, either child or a disabled person, a disabled adult, um, up to a maximum of two individuals. And so the, the reality is here that the two individuals that could qualify are the child age eight and the bedridden aunt, uh, regardless of her age. The 13-year-old child would not qualify at all, but either way, this is a rather simple question to get the correct answer. The maximum amount of qualifying expense is 3,000 per qualifying person. There are two qualifying persons, and that makes the correct answer C, $6,000. Moving on with question number two, all of the following individuals lived with the taxpayer all year. The taxpayer can claim their dependency exemptions. Which of the following would qualify the taxpayer for the child tax credit? Now, one of the things to be aware of when you're reading an exam question is to really pay attention to what the wording of the problem is saying. This first question up here is referring to the child and dependent care credit. The second question is referring to the child tax credit. Although they have similar names, they are entirely different with different rules. And of course, for the child tax credit, we're looking for a child who is a qualifying child under the age of 17. Let's see who fits on this list. A 15-year-old niece, does she qualify? Yes, she is a qualifying child for purposes of calculating the child tax credit, so A is a correct answer. B, 17-year-old daughter, out because she's too old. A 13-year-old child of a friend, out because that person is not considered to be a qualifying child. They do not meet the relationship test. And question number 19, 19-year-old 19 disabled son is not under age 17. He is too old. So that leaves 2A being the only correct answer. Number three, which of the following expenses qualifies for the child independent care credit? Payments to a housekeeper who also babysits the child while you go grocery shopping? 
No, uh, going grocery shopping is clearly not going to work. You cannot claim a child independent care expense except with relation to the cost of going to work. Going grocery shopping is not going to work. And furthermore, a housekeeper who sometimes babysits Iris specifically provides that as an example of what is not child care <laughs> and not a qualifying expense. 3B, payments to your 21-year-old dependent son. That is out because you cannot claim a child independent care expense for someone that you claim as a dependent. C, payments to your sister who lived with you all year but is not your dependent. You can claim the credit for expenses paid to a person who lives with you, provided that person is not your dependent and is not your child under the age of 19. And so in this case, C does allow the sister to be uh, a qualifying expense. And then finally, D, payments to a child daycare center for your 13-year-old daughter while you are at work. Well, the, the, the center itself is a qualifying location. The expenses paid to go to the work are qualifying expenses, except for the fact that the child is simply too old. The child must be under age 13, and age 13 means no. So ultimately, 3C is the only correct response. Moving on, this particular uh, quiz contained too many problems, more than the usual one. So I'm going to flip over to the forms that coincide to the problems themselves. And mini problem number one says, Hermione is single. During the year, she paid Hogwarts after school daycare $4,000 for her six-year-old son, Jason, and $3,500 her nine-year-old daughter, Samantha. All child care costs were paid to Hogwarts School. Hermione's federal AGI and earned income is 33000 The amount on her Form 1040, Line 46, is 1319 That's actually her federal tax. Prepare her attached Form 2441 and answer the questions. So essentially, I've given you enough information in the wording of this problem to fill out a 2441 for Hermione. We begin in part one by entering the care provider's name and information, Hogwarts School. We enter an address. We enter an EIN. And then we enter on lock column D the actual amount of qualified expense. You can see the qualified expense is $4,000 plus $3,500, $7,500. Then we enter the names of the dependents that qualify for the expense. We have Jason and Samantha. The qualifying expense for uh, Jason is $4,000 for Samantha, it's $3,500, but the amount that we enter on line three cannot exceed $6,000, so even though the expense is $7,500, $6,000 is the amount we enter. We then look over at the wording of the problem. It says her adjusted gross income is $33,000, so we enter Hermione's AGI on line four, and then we look to the table to find her amount of income. Her income is not more than 33000 so we go to the line that says 31 through 33000 That gives us 0.26. We carry 0.26 over to line 8. We multiply 6000 by 0 0.26, and we get 1560. Remember that the amount of child independent care credit cannot exceed the tax shown on the return. The tax shown on the return is $1,319. So although her credit potentially could be as much as 1560, she cannot claim more than her tax. Therefore, the amount on line 11, the amount of actual credit that she gets to claim, is $1,319. And moving on with mini problem number two. Here we have a character named Horatio, age 33, he is single. His AGI and earned income were $25,000 for the year. And during the year, he provided more than half the support for the following people who lived with him all year. Maria, his niece, age 11. John, his brother, age 17. And Sally, his daughter, age 12. Well, what we're concerned with uh, for Horatio is that the individuals that he can claim the child tax credit for have to be related to him in a qualifying child relationship, and they also must be under age 17. What well, happens to be all three of these relationships are valid relationships for the, qualify, for the child tax credit. However, John, his brother, is age 17. That means he is not under age 17. So John's out. But Maria and Sally are both individuals that will qualify him for the child tax credit. The maximum child tax credit is $1,000 per qualifying child. Two times 1000 is $2,000. But remember, the maximum refundable child tax credit has to be reduced by any child tax credit claimed up earlier on the tax return. And in the next part of the, the sentence, it says Horatio's child tax credit that he is claiming on line 51 of his Form 1040 is $388. 
388 is going to reduce the amount of child tax credit he is ultimately allowed to claim. So let's see how all of this comes together on his 8812 schedule. We come over to Schedule 8812, and on line one, we enter $2,000, which is $1,000 times the two qualifying children. Then on line two, we enter the amount of child tax credit claimed on line 51 of his Form 1040, $388. 388 from 2000 is 1612 That is the maximum qualifying uh, child tax credit that he can claim as refundable credit, but we also have to look to see if there's going to be any limitations on that. Ultimately, the limitation we look to see is the amount by which his income exceeds $3,000, and his income exceeds $3,000 by $22,000. His income is $25,000. We subtract $3,000 from $25,000, and we're left with $22,000. We multiply $22,000 by 15%, and we get 3300 and ultimately his uh, his allowable child tax credit his refundable child tax credit is going to be the lesser of line 6 or line 3 and so that makes uh, line 3 the amount that he will ultimately carry to the 1040 and claim as refundable child tax credit so that concludes the review of the session 13 quiz at this point it's time to finish up with your Open book midterm exam involving preparation of a tax return for Buffy Vampire Slayer. And it's all t also time to bone up and practice on all of the quiz questions you've had from sessions 1 through 13 as you prepare for and sit the closed book midterm exam. Thank you and best of success on your tests. And we'll see you back in session 14 after you have completed the midterm exams. Bye-bye. Watcherton, W-A-T-E-R-T-O-N, Watcherton.